too. So well, excited. look, I get enough of Big Joe every day, <laughs> and I love Big Joe. But uh, you know, I've always enjoyed talking shop with you and different things. And we'll get we got some basketball that we can watch and keep you updated on on that as we go along. I'm going to be honest. Yesterday was my day where. I watched a ton of basketball. Yeah. I have hardly watched any today. Just it's been so busy. So uh, we'll definitely try and do that tonight. I, um, how about uh, Western Kentucky up on Marquette right now, 43-36 at the half. Yeah, man. Good for the Hilltoppers. It is good for the Hilltoppers. Not good for my bracket. Marquette no, no. is a team I thought would go a little bit further than than this in the um, you know in in the whole setup, but yeah, I mean, shout out to Western Kentucky. You got Northwestern that just went yep. final. They beat FAU also. So and I I really thought FAU was gonna win. I had FAU winning that one. So did you? Yeah, I yeah. did too. I did too. Uh, Baylor beats Colgate by a lot, ninety two sixty seven. So no toothpaste for them. Uh, and then the other game going on right now, San Diego State leads UAB thirty five twenty nine. They just tipped in the second half. So. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, all those things. Lloyd Cushenberry, new center for the Titans, going to join us in about 30 minutes That's right. here on the show. Looking forward to talking to him because we've been saying all offseason the Titans need to fix the offensive line, but they got to find a center. I look yeah. at the center as that's the quarterback of the offensive line. I think they got a pretty darn good one. They got a darn good one for sure. And everybody points to the Calvin Ridley sign, and it's funny because after they signed Calvin Ridley, I had to go back and adjust my assignment because we had to do a blurb on the the best signing that the Titans yeah. made, the most impactful one. And rest assured, Lloyd Cushenberry was absolutely the guy that I had there. You get him a young center, right, a guy that clearly – is not going to get walked back to to the quarterback. He doesn't give up sacks. He's solid in run blocking also. Versatile and if you want to run power, you could do that. If you want to run gap scheme with him, you could do that. And oh, he's athletic enough to get yeah. out and on the move in in zone blocking too. So I remember a few years ago when I think it was the free agent class when they signed Bud Dupree mm. and then they also signed Danico Autry and I just remember going y'all just wait Danico Autry is going to be the one. That's the yeah. that's going to be the most important signing that they've made in free agency. Turned out that was true. Right. Sneaky good. Like I hate seeing him go to the Texans. Hate, hate seeing, seeing him yeah. go. I think Calvin Ridley is going to be great, but Lloyd Cushenberry might be the mo the most important signing that they've made to this point because you got to get that offensive line shored up. And and what's funny to me is you know whether they continue to address the right side or not, you mm. feel like. The left side is going to be addressed in the draft, or the left tackle is going to be addressed in the draft. Then you got you and you may you you have some thoughts on that. But if you do that, you could have a a Joe Alt or or a Fashnu there at left tackle. Yeah, and then obviously Skaronsky at left guard, Cushenberry in the middle. I think you're going to see a lot of running left uh, right, when it comes right. to the Titans. The offense. offensive line will be addressed. Yes. Now, what's interesting about this is at pick number seven. Is Alt going to be there? Because you never know. The Chargers may do it. I honestly, I tell you what I think. I think the Chargers go ahead and draft J.C. Latham and put him at at right tackle over Alt. Over Alt, they're not the only team. Yeah, that I, may have him. He's gone up the, he's, the board because you look at that size. You yeah. look at that athleticism as a coach. You're just like, but he's a pure mm, right tackle, right? Pure you're, right tackle. Yeah. You don't flip him, yeah. and and that's fine. That's fine sure. because. This league, you need bookends, and they already got Rashawn Slater. So you put him at right tackle, now you got the bookends. That's something I could see. But you also look at if he's there for the Titans, I think there's going to be some consideration there as well. If Latham's there for the if Titans. If Latham's there, I think there will be some consideration. I don't think it's a slam dunk for them. Now, to me, if Alt is there at seven and we're not talking trade back and, and – Right, Marvin Harrison Jr. isn't there and so on and so forth. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going up. But I don't know that they do that. Well, to me, and you and I haven't really gotten gotten a chance to talk about this much. You know, we've texted and stuff, but I feel like the Titans right now are in a p position where it's going to be really hard to screw that pick up. Yeah. Like with all that could be available, whether it's, you know, the tackles that we've talked about. Dallas Turner. Dallas Turner. Ed uh, Edge. Edge. Bowers, if he's there, neighbors, you know, Adunze. Like, there are a ton of options that I believe are going to be there at seven because 
and and you know, there's always that chance that somebody in front of you is going to do something stupid, and and kind of mess it all up. I mean, I, there's definitely in the char- Chargers. That's the team I kind of look at <laughs> that that might do that. But I mean, I yeah. feel like the first three picks are going to be quarterback. I, I, I'll tell you this too: the advantage that they have also, what you just said, the first three picks quarterbacks. So now you have because you, you know it. The GM, what, what Floyd Reese used to say, you have a quarterback draft. And you have the draft. Right. Right. So now right. you got some really good players getting pushed down. Right. And that's going to give you an opportunity because every team, typically what you do, you have five to seven guys that you're like, all right, these are the ones we got it. We got to have them. And with three of those being quarterbacks, it's going to give them a better opportunity, as you mentioned, to get some of these top level talent guys. And then even if they move back, it's going to help them still because now you're in the realm of a, of a Tali Save Fuaga. You're in the yeah. realm of, you know, guys like Terry and Arnold, if you want him. Quinn Yan Mitchell, if you want him. So there's a lot to look at there. Very fortunate for this Titans team. And especially considering this J.J. McCarthy talk, he had his pro day today. What do you think of him? Yeah, I, I don't go for him high. I think he's a guy you design your system around him. One thing I do like is that if you look third downs – the money down, that's when they, they went to him, and he delivered for the most yeah. part. That's good, but here's you got a five-star player, right? A five-star prospect. Jim Harbaugh is a known – he he's known for – he's a former quarterback. Yeah. You get him, you have him in the mix, and, yes, they won a lot. But how much was it focused on running the football? Right. So it's like, okay, are you protecting your quarterback? Or are you keeping him from blossoming to his potential? Either way, as a five-star player, like you probably want to give him – if he's really the truth like that, you probably want to give him a chance. They didn't really give him that chance. And now, I don't know, man. I don't know that I put him in the same as Drake May and Jaden Daniels and obviously – Oh, I certainly don't. Williams, you know. I think it's close. He, he along with Michael Penix, uh, Bo, Bo Nix. Look. Spencer Rattler, too. I tell you, that's another, like, top star, yeah. five-star athlete. I love the way he left Oklahoma after getting beaten out by Caleb Williams. Went to South Carolina. It was humbling. Yeah. Very humbling for him. And for an arrogant little, you know what, like little him. boy. <laughs> like he that was, was That was good. <laughs> yeah. And, and now you see him. And, and, and talking to him at the Senior Bowl and, and seeing him talk at the Combine, you could tell like he's grown and he's become a leader. And sometimes all you need is that humbling experience and that'll put you right on track where you need to be. He I've kind of gotten the vibe that he's gone from, you know, a boy to a man. Yeah. Like he's he's been humbled. I think that's yeah. that's the best way to put it. Yeah. Um but I feel like the top three quarterbacks in this draft, they're kind of up here and the rest are a good notch below them. Now could you have a Jordan Love in there that has to develop? And, you know, like if you're Minnesota and you like you really like J.J. McCarthy, I don't think Sam Darnold was a terrible signing for them. Now, I know he, he flamed out with the Jets and, and the Panthers, but that was two pretty bad situations he was in. Yeah, low a, cost. You're low cost, yeah. a year with Shanahan, a year in San Francisco, I think was good for him. I, I mean, there's no reason in my mind he couldn't be – like, because you're not sitting Stop there in Minnesota it. going, hey, we're going to go win the Super Bowl with Sam Darnold. Right. Like, you got other holes that you got to worry about just like here. So, why not? You know, why not just let him start for a year and then develop what you got behind him? Does he move the needle for no. J.J., Justin Jefferson? And that's the thing that I wonder. No. And if what I, is he Justin thinking? Jefferson's probably, like, talking to his agent, like, hey, start making get calls. Me up. Get, get me up out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? How how would you feel about a flip T. Higgins and a pick for Justin Jefferson? If you're the Bengals? Yeah. Like so get so then you'd have Jefferson and Jamar Chase? That's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's you're wrong. Cheating. You cheat. That's a cheat code right there. That's that's yeah. just wrong. <laughs> I was just curious what you thought. Not oh, I mean, if if like I'm that. Cincinnati, I love it. Yeah. I mean, if I'm if I'm Minnesota, I love it. I, I mean, think you're it's still good. Getting, in, yeah, you, you're getting some comp, like, good compensation. Yeah. You know it's I mean? hard. So. It's hard to. It's hard to actually say this, but like, Minnesota would be downgrading just a just a bit. Mm-hmm. But at least you get the pick back. 
and you get a good player. Yeah, you know? and then so. you got Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson fighting for footballs. Man. And, jo- and Joe Burrow's just sitting there just like, whoop, this whoop, is, This is whoop. 2019 all over again. <laughs> <laughs> like, I got my boys back. I'm, <laughs> I'm good. He is Teron Davenport, Chase McCabe. We're in today for Jared Stillman. He has a day off. We're going to hit a lot of different things throughout the show, including the Predators and the 16-game point streak. But Lloyd Cushenberry going to join us at 2.30. And, Teron, I know you have done a, a lot of research on some things, including there's somebody that you really, really like, had a pro day today mm-hmm. that you feel the Titans might ought to look at and uh, could help an area that they really haven't gotten to address yet. <laughs> I think yeah. they've tried, but uh, it really hadn't worked out. So we'll do that coming up next, Jason Jason TD. I just did it. Hey. In for Stillman and Company, 1025-1063, the game.
Yeah, I play every position. I play a zero, I play a nine. I can run, I can hit, uh, I get my hands inside. I can do anything, man. Like, just give me an opportunity to put my cleats in the ground. I showed that at the Senior Bowl. I got better each and every day against the best competition in college football. I played in the SEC, which is the best conference in football. Um, and that's the thing. I don't want to talk about myself too much. Just cut the tape on it and tell you. And, and not talking about yourself, but your school. A long history of D linemen that, that come to the league. What is it about Mizzou that, that makes you guys so successful? Yeah, it's D line Zoo, man. It's just all the Mizzou goats, you know, uh, walking into our room every day, got the wall with Mizzou D-line goats. And I honestly used to look at the wall and be like, man, I hope I get my name on the wall one day. And uh, hopefully I just take advantage of my opportunities. But guys like Marcus Golden, he always texts me and hit me up. And that's just inspiring because he's where I want to be, you know, and he definitely get back to his university. That's Darius Robinson, Missouri defensive lineman at the Combine with our man Teron. Chase McCabe. And to Ron Davenport with you in for Jared today on Stillman and Company. So Darius Robinson is yeah. somebody that TD, I feel like as you go through your draft process and you look at the different positions that the Titans need, you always seem to find these ones that are, are kind of like TD's darlings. Mm -hmm. Why is Darius Robinson one of those? Yeah, first thing, and you heard what he said, right? He can play zero to yeah. nine. And so I inside or out? inside of anywhere call yeah. him the piano man up yep. and he play up and down you know and i think when you look at his his tape right so i posted the uh, some clips from the kentucky tape this year and he had i believe it was two and a half sacks in the game but you saw him line up head up over the nose i mean over the center as a nose tackle you saw him line up in the three five he, he lined up in a four eye he lined up as a stand-up outside rusher everything so for a scheme, and we don't know what Denar Robinson, or excuse me, I always say that, the Michigan quarterback. We don't know what Denar Wilson is yeah. going to run, if it's going to be an even or odd front. But this is a guy who's played 3-4 end, 4-3 tackle, and even wide alignment as a stand-up rusher at 6'5", 285. So you got that. But then I just love guys that, you know, for lack of better terms, are goons. You know what I mean? And that's one of the things, Danico Autry, Danico is a goon. Like, he's just somebody you yeah. put him in there and you're just like, yo, just go mess stuff up. And that's what he does. And you watch Darius Robinson, that's what he does too. And I see a lot of similarities just in the hands, right? The Both of them, they got, like, thick, big hands. And sometimes when they put their hands on the linemen, you see it kind of shock them. Yeah. And I love to see that, right, because that's violence. That's what you want on your guys up front in the trenches. So he brings that. Then the hustle. There's a clip. Uh, I also posted that on Twitter against Georgia, right? He's a D tackle in this in this situation. And the Georgia running back gets gets in the alley and he gets in the open. He stumbles. But you know who runs him down? Darius Robinson. That's hustle. Yeah. And those are the things that you want and to look, see. And look, he's pretty quick for a big boy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, I mean, there's, there's also things with him that came out uh, from talking to him at the combine that were interesting also. Yeah. Uh, eight and a half sacks last year from Missouri, yeah. including he had a stretch starting with the Memphis game, going through the Florida game where he had at least a half a sack every every mm -hmm. game, mm -hmm. which was pretty impressive. So registering in that, and they obviously the Titans need some help up front. Where do you have him graded draft wise? That's the problem. Anywhere from twenty six to forty is where I project. So he could be somebody that maybe an option at thirty eight. He may be an option. He's one of those guys, and you see it every year, right? Like you talk draft, and there's 50 first-round picks. You sure. know what I mean? Oh, he's going first round. He's going for – there's 50 of them. Uh, Will Levis on line two? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but only 32 are in last, last year's yeah. case 31 gets, gets picked in, in the first round. He's one of those guys where, you know, if he's there at the top, top part of the second round, I could see a team trading up. I could see, you know, the Titans taking them, obviously depending on what they did in, the, in that first round. But there's also things with him that – so you get those gold star helmet type players. Yeah. You know what I mean? He he told me that he played basketball a lot up, in, up until I believe it was ninth grade, ninth or tenth grade. He shifted to football because he was like – I don't know that I have a future in basketball, yeah. but I know I could play football. And also, the, the saying, you know, you love when guys say it, 
I like playing football because I could hurt people and not get in trouble. Yeah, right. You, you yeah. got to be a certain level of sick to play oh, football, yeah. right? So you got that. But then the thing that really uh, makes him, in my opinion, a, a gold star uh, type of guy is, is his family is a military background. Yeah. Right? And, and they said, look, man, you got a choice. You're either going to go into military or football, right? Right. He considered the Marines. Imagine a 6'5", 285-pound oh. Marine. Like, you don't want to mess with that. But he chose football. And that's not to say he doesn't like military because his mom, his grand, his sure. grandmother, his uncle, like, his background is there. But he decided he wanted to play football. So the discipline is there. That's what I'm getting at. I, I always look at, and Jeffrey Simmons is the prime example of this, of – you know, guys that are on the defensive front there in the trenches, mm -hmm. those are the dudes that if I know i got to walk into a fight, I'm yeah. taking them with me. You want them walking. Yeah. And that's he's he's what you would call a get-off-the-bus type of player. Like, yeah. You travel, you're traveling somewhere, you want him to be the first to get off the bus because right. then you're looking and you're like, hang on. Oh. oh, no. <laughs> what? <laughs> i got to go up <laughs> you against that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so because, uh, look, they – it's it's a position group that obviously Autry's gone – uh, Tier Tart, we know what happened there, and I know he's still out there, but I, kind of floating, you know, yep. kind of floating. But they need help. Jeffrey Simmons needs help, mm -hmm. um, and and so they they haven't been able to. I know they've been in on some guys in free agency, yeah. but there's not a whole lot left. No, there really isn't much left, and I think signing Sebastian Joseph Day it gives them most of all it gives them experience. Yeah, he has what I think 35 career starts. Yeah. You look at the guys outside of him, you, you know, uh, Colburn, uh, T.K. McClendon, uh, Quinn Bohanna. You know, those guys collectively have 15 starts. Right. So it's like, oh, you're putting a lot of inexperience next to your prime possession on defense. Is there a guy, though, in that group that – remember, you know, Tierra Tart was an unproven, unknown commodity and just really came on. He flourished in, in that system. Um Sounds like he might have got a little big headed at times, but it, there was a lot to that. Yeah, I, a, I know. There's, there's a, a lot. lot. Yeah, there's a lot. There's I, a lot more to that. Can't but, really say, but there's a lot. To I know. That. Yeah. But is there a guy that could fit that mold that maybe we're overlooking right now? But they and I know it's a different coaching staff, but they seem to like and think they can work. With. Yeah, yeah. So around this time last year, I was ranting, and Jared to tell you, I kept saying, "Man, there's this guard at, at TCU by the name of Steve Avila." Man, this guy, is, he's good. Watched him against Texas. And, man, Texas, let me tell you, their D linemen are really good. There were three guys there. Two of them, right. Tavondre Sweat, Byron Murphy, are coming out this year. One of them came out last year, Keandre Colburn. And he's actually on the Titans now. Yeah, He, I think, you know, he's 6'2", 6'3", 300, like in that 330, 325 range. Big body that you could put on the line to occupy space next to Jeffrey Simmons. He, if I had to pick one, he would be the one. But then you look at just like trying to fill that Danico Autry role to obviously a much lesser degree, T.K. McClendon, just as far as like giving that versatility to play inside and outside. But I think Keandre Colburn is, is the one that I will watch out for to emerge. Okay. That's something to keep an eye on. Yes, sir. Uh, with that. 615-737-1025, um, that's our phone and text line, driven by WilsonCountyHonda.com. Uh, we are now going to be joined by Lloyd Cushenberry coming up next. I'm looking forward to talking to him. Absolutely. We, we led the show off of just how important of a signing he is. Thank you for setting that up. He joins us next. Stillman and Company, Chase and TD, Toronto Davenport in today for Jared here on 102.5, 106.3 The Game.
Chasing TD in for Jared today. Stillman and Company, 1025-1063, the game. Lloyd Cushenberry going to join us in just a few minutes. We had the music for him, too. I know. We had it ready and everything. That was from LSU, right? Yeah, yeah. That, man, get to get. That was one of the most popular songs that year. They, they won the championship, and it was funny because they were at the uh, White House, and they had people in the White House dancing, doing the <laughs> dance to get the Gat dance, man. It's hilarious, man. Yeah, so looking forward to uh, talking to him. You know, Caroline's been on vacation, but uh, a, a fellow LSU Tiger yeah. coming on, she's got to be excited about that. Sure. So we, uh, we'll we catch up with him in just uh, a few minutes as we kind of look at the Titans. And w one thing we're going to do during the 4 o'clock hour, we'll obviously hit other things, but kind of a state of where the Titans are. And, you know, I've asked this question throughout the week. I did it during Jared versus Joe. I asked Big Joe about this. That do you feel that the Titans, it to this point, obviously everything's an incomplete right now. Still have the draft to go. There's probably going to be some other signings as guys get, um, as guys get, you know, released and all that stuff. But do you feel like the Tennessee Titans have set Will Levis up for to be as successful as he can? And and when it's all said and done that the answer to that would be yes. Yeah, I think what's left to be done, they still have to need – they need additions on the offensive yeah. line. They still need – They got to get the left tackle. Yeah, the left tackle. Um, really, figure out right really tackle. Really right, yeah. I mean, you know, like what is going to – what is it going to be? You know, is it going to be um, – is it going to be Dylan Radins? Is it going to be Petit Ferrer? They, they need to figure that out and ensure that part of it out. I think personally, so – I think when you look at um, that right guard position, Sadiq Charles, another guy on that LSU yeah. team, I, I think he, he Brunsko, like I think they could find an answer there. Specifically, you look at Sadiq Charles, because from the people that I talked to in Washington, they didn't move on from him or let him go because of lack of talent. They yeah. felt he had talent, but it was – that frustration of the injuries. Right. So if they can – because they said every time it seemed like he was ready to turn that corner and, and, and make that ascension, there would be an injury. Right. And that was the tough thing with it. So if, if he could stay healthy and they get him in there at the right guard, now you got, hey, look, a reuniting, right? LSU center and, and guard. He, of course, he played tackle at LSU, but that's a different story. But nevertheless – like you, that will help show off that offensive line. And yeah. I think that's the first thing you have to do, especially for a vertical passer like Will Levis. And in my opinion, this is why the Cushenberry signing is so much uh, underrated because he's a guy that shores up. And the last thing a quarterback wants is that quarter that pocket getting pushed back to his his face. And a vertical passer like Levis, you want to be able to follow through with your yeah. your throws. And one way to do that is by having that pocket. Well, I think Lloyd Cushenberry the third can certainly help that. He joins us now here on one oh two five the game. Lloyd, good afternoon. How are you? Uh, how you how you guys doing? Doing fantastic. We're excited to have you here in Nashville. Uh I want to start with the, the you know, one of the reasons why you came here, but how excited are you to work with somebody like Bill Callahan as the offensive line coach, somebody that's been in this league for a very long time and has helped uh, d develop some great offensive linemen throughout his years as a coach. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm very excited. You know, like I said before, his, his resume speaks for itself. He you know, coached and developed a bunch of uh, all pro and pro bowl guys. And you know, I, I look forward to just getting to work with him man, just buying in and listening to whatever he wants me to do. And, man, I, I, I think it can help me get my game to another level. Lloyd, one of the things I want to ask you about is just developing as a player, right? You look at how on the offensive line, especially like you guys, you don't get the chance to bang as much, right, during practice. How do you go about refining and improving despite not being able to have that contact in practice? I think a, a big part of the game is just mental. Um, just knowing um, knowing all, all aspects of the game and you know, allowing the game to, to slow down. And that, that's what really helped helped me throughout the years, along with getting stronger and getting uh, fine tuning a little technique thing. It's, it's mostly mental. Um, the more I stop thinking, the more I stop worrying about assignments or anyone else's assignments, man, the, the better I got. So I think just continuing continuing to develop your 
your mental um, knowledge of the game helps helps a bunch at our position. What's it like on your end knowing that you're you're kind of a part of a, a rebuilt offensive line? Peter was there last year as a draft pick. You're going to have some some holdovers, but but overall, this is something that Rand Carthon and the Titans ha, have been working on to give Will Levis the you know the protection in front of him. But obviously, playing the center position, it being so important. How excited are you to be a part of that process to, to make this one of the best lines in the league? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, like you said, we're kind of starting from the, uh, from the ground up, and I look forward to the, the challenge um, of coming here and helping build this organization. Um, you know, they, they believe in me. That's the reason they came and got me. So I, I look forward to, man, just the challenge of trying to build this uh, a great group of guys um, that's, you know, going to get the job done week in, week out. With that belief in you that obviously was shown by the contract, you mentioned in, in Denver how the offensive line, like you guys kind of ran things. How do you go about making that happen here with the Titans, especially considering this is a group that is rebuilding? Yeah, I think, uh, like I mentioned a few weeks ago while I was there, you know, it all starts with work. Um, you can't really come in and, and expect things to change right away. You know, it's a process. You got to, we all got to fall in love with uh, just that process and the grind of getting to the end goal. And, and you know, that's where it's going to start. And we start here in a, in a few weeks and look forward to meeting the guys and just uh, starting the grind because it's going to be, it's going to be a challenge, but hey, uh, I think we're ready. We're talking to Lloyd Cushenberry, Titans center. Now you, you obviously experienced this in college at LSU of, you haven't having to learn how to win. It's not easy to win. You guys, when you won yeah. the national championship, that was a, a journey that wasn't just that year. And so, how do you take some of those lessons that you learned at LSU and apply it to to a young team with a young quarterback that that is like you said, starting from the ground up, but having to learn how, what it's like to win in the National Football League? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's tough because you know, I never want to kind of never want to compare college to the league. I mean, it's completely different game. Um, but that that was something that you, you got to learn. You know, you have to learn how to start winning games and, you know, stop. You have to learn how to not lose uh, before you, you know, learn how to start winning. And that's the little things, the penalties, the details. Uh, it all goes into it. So, and that's what we, we, we'll be starting here in April, uh, just learning, um, you know, how to, how, to win, how to win these games, not lose these games before we start winning. Hey, hey, Lloyd, you weren't here when we came back from the break, but we had that get the gat on for you. I, I got to ask real quick. Uh, <laughs> you look at the video, man, Justin Jefferson, all those guys, they were dancing. I didn't see you in it, but were, were, you, were you hitting the dance for them? I was actually on the side sitting down watching them make that video. I was, I was at the video, but, uh, yeah, you, you never see me in any of, the, any of those videos. I was over there laughing somewhere. Yeah, real bad boys moving silence. I get it. I, 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 the boxing part of it, though, I, I think that's pretty cool. I, I saw where you, you took that up. Um, I talked to a BYU uh, offensive lineman. He was telling me how it helped, like with one part, like no, learning to punch with one hand versus two, et cetera. Can you kind of just open up as far as like how boxing helped you? Uh, I really started to do it last summer just for like car just extra cardio. Um, and it also helps with our position. I mean, punching and uh, reaction speed. So, you know, I, I started, you know, just trying to get in a uh, great shape going into camp, and I kind of just continued to do it throughout the summer, and it, it's helped me a, a bunch. Um, and I, I feel like it's helped me a lot, and I'll continue to do it this summer. Talking to Lloyd Cushenberry, uh, obviously with Brian Callahan coming in here as the head coach. I know you have some former teammates from college that – played with him in Cincinnati. Have you had a chance to, to talk to, to Joe or or, uh, or Chase about him at all, about what, what to expect as the you know as he comes in here as the head coach and brings his offense in? Yeah, I got a chance to uh, ask Joe a few questions about him. And, he, you know, he just mentioned a uh, great offensive mind, great football mind, going to take care of his guys, uh, you know, listen and, and uh, provide you know, feedback, listen to the players' feedback and uh, just a – a great, great, great guy to be around. Great coach. So, uh, yeah, he talked to me a little bit about him, and I, I look forward to being around him a little bit more and uh, getting to chop, you know, chop it up and pick his brain a little bit more. We talked. Oh, sorry about that. We talked a little bit about the contact in, in practice and the lack thereof. But in training camp, you're going to get that opportunity. 
How much are you looking forward to that iron sharpness, iron aspect, you know, going against a guy like Jeffrey Simmons consistently? Yeah, yeah that, that should be great for, uh, for both of us. I know he's going to push me. Hopefully I can push him to uh, continue to get better. And man, I, I think it's going to be uh, – I mean, that's – that's what it takes to get to the to the level we want to get to. I sharpen I iron sharpen the iron every single day, so I, I can't wait. What uh what do you know about Will Levis and how much are you looking forward to working with him? Uh no 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 don't know too much about him. I've heard a lot about him. Uh his work ethic, uh the way he, he loves the game, man. I, I see highlights, he, he can sling it. I see that. But uh, man, I can't wait to just do whatever I can to protect him, keep him clean and uh help him get the balls are our playmakers because, you know, we have a lot of them on offense. So it's my job, and, uh, along with the rest of us up front, to keep them clean. Well, Lloyd, we're looking forward to uh, getting to know you a little bit better and seeing you here in Nashville uh, when things get underway in a, in a month or so. But uh, welcome to Nashville, and thanks so much for doing this today. Hey, thank you all for having me, man. Absolutely. That is Lloyd Cushenberry, uh, a new Titan center, joining us here on the program. And, again, uh, just a key part of this offense, mm -hmm. offense in general, but the offensive line. Yeah, it's going to be huge. I can't stress enough how important it is to protect the pocket from the inside. I can't stress that enough. Yeah. And when you have a guy like him that could just sink that anchor and not get walked back, you know, look, Aaron Brewer was an outstanding run blocker, had issues in pass pro, and that was a big part of – why the passing game didn't work, especially when they fell behind in third and long yeah. situations. Not going to be the same this year. So I'm going to reset my question to you, and I'm going to tell you where I'm going with it, too, when it comes to setting Levis up for success. He's TD, Teron Davenport, Chase McCabe, in today for Jared Stellman, 1025, 1063, the game.
Chasing TD in today for Jared Stillman on Stillman and Company, broadcasting from the Spring Hill Heating and Cooling Game Nashville Studios, keeping your home feeling comfortable all year round. And our updates of the tournament brought to you by Toyota. Ready, set, go. Get your Toyota today at toyota.com. Appreciate Lloyd Cushenberry for joining us here on the program. Again, Jared with the day off. And so I asked this question, and Big Joe and I had a very spirited debate. Mm. about it of do you feel like when this process is all said and done so get through free agency get through the draft and they get ready to open the season with a 53-man roster that they have put will levis in a position to be as successful as he possibly can joe kind of took it as when you look at the offense now they've done a lot of work on the offense i I, i'm not doubting that i i really like what they've done on the offense and and that is you know, basically assuming that they're going to address the offensive line in many, many ways when it comes to the draft, which I think they're going to. They're going to figure out tackle and and all of that. But I also think the defense is a part of it. And I know some of that is, you know, kind of a wait and see. They're letting the, the prices come down maybe on the safety market, mm-hmm. linebackers, things like that. Again, I recognize that it's incomplete, but – if they've set the offense up where Levis has protection and he has weapons and he's putting up, you know, anywhere from 21 to, you know, 24 points a game, but the defense has given up 27, then he's having to he's having to make throws that he usually wouldn't make and therefore he's going to be more more prone to mistakes. So I look at it as while it's not all like ran and you know, not all their fault, sometimes it's just the way the market is and the the position they've been left in that's part of setting him up, him up for success. And that's why I think this process is going to take more than one offseason. Yeah, no, without a doubt, it's going to take more than one offseason. You would like for it to happen in one offseason, sure. right? You look at Houston, I think that was an anomaly because it's very rare that you hit on basically every free agent signing you right. make. And you have a tremendous draft. Like That doesn't happen all the time. But also look at what's happened, too. Now they got to play a first-place schedule because they overachieved. So now what did they do in free agency? They had to overspend, mm-hmm. and they had to go – and they addressed the defense, which is what they really needed to do. Mm-hmm. And now they're, they're, they're trying to play catch-up with, yeah. with where they ended up. I think they're going to regress because – I now, now, look. It's going to be C- tough. C.J. Stroud, the, he, he is him. I, yeah. I get it. Like yeah. that, That's a dude. But you know how this works. Like I think everybody thought in the progression that, okay, maybe they'd go – to a second place schedule or a th- or a third place yeah, schedule. Yeah. Yeah. They overachieved. Yeah, no, absolutely. They and so I do think that, you know, that they that they'll regress just a hair. Not a lot, but they could fall back because it also depends on what does Jacksonville do, Indy, and then, you know, what do the Titans look yeah, like? Yeah, and you look at circumstantial. They had two years as one of the worst franchises right. in sport. They were able to parlay the Deshaun Watson situation into some extra picks. That helped them. They got the best offensive player and the best defensive player. I mean, like, the roster was not pitiful, right? You just had players like Aniko Collins just waiting to be on earth by good quarterback play. Everything, it was a perfect storm. We'll put it that way. I don't know that it's the perfect storm here with the Titans. There's more things that have to be done. There's some talent, but I I think if you compare rosters starting from after the, you know, the building crumbled, I think Houston's roster was better. That being said, yeah, it's going to take two, you know, two years. You look at Will Levis in this situation. Uh, I look at the the Nico Collins and Traylon Burks situation as similar uh-huh. ones, right? And I think for Traylon Burks, and it's it's amazing how confidence works, right? Like, I never played in the league, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I never sure. played arena, Canada, any of that. But I remember in in, in school in college. Once I started to feel like I was that dude, I was that dude. Right. You know what I mean? And I, I think confidence. that's something that, that Trey has to be able to develop. And he had that going into camp in Minnesota. In fact, the play that he got hurt, he showed that he was that dude because he cooked the DB. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's really the key to me, Traylon Burke's ascension. I think that's the key part. He, he's, and he's, he's a tough one. Because it's like we've talked about this and talked about it with D Mace and Chris, and you either got dog in here or you don't. Like, like you don't teach that. That is yeah. not something that you know you or a coach or whatever can teach a kid at any level. You either got it or you don't. And look, there are guys that 
that don't have it that that make it and last in this league. But most of the time, you got to have that, yeah. you know, and you, you have, like, like, the hunger. You see the ribs. Yeah, like right. You, you got to have that dog yeah. in him. Derek Mason, a fourth-round pick, he had dog in him. Yep. That's why he played 15 years in the yeah. NFL. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I tell D. Mace, you know. And I just don't know with Traylon. That's my that's what I'm saying. I don't yeah. I don't know. I tell D. Mace, uh, like, we talked about that with Traylon. I, I tell you this, there's two examples to me that he has the dog. The first one, he cooked my favorite corner in the league. I love Jair Alexander. Yeah. He cooked him. Play action. You know what I mean? Got up and gave him the you too small <laughs> gesture. That tells me he got dog. And then yeah. to make that play like that. And then another example also is was was the Chargers game, right? The play action. He caught the deep pass. He got up and he spiked it because he was hype. I thought that. But there was an interaction I had with him last year. And it was like mid season where Every every team that played the Titans, every defense, would have the whole city in the box, right? And they didn't care anything about the receivers on the outside. So I went through receiver by receiver. Or no, it wasn't last year. It was two years ago because Hopkins wasn't there. And I, I asked Burks, and the way he looked at me, like the anger in his face, it was like, you know, when a wolf is ready to attack and it shows his teeth or a dog, yeah. you know what I mean? And he was like, I hate that. Because right. it makes them think that their player is better than me and nobody in this league could cover me. And I was just like, oh, that's what we've been waiting to see. You know what I mean? And so when he showed that, you know, I felt like, yeah, he, he's got that dog in him. It just has, yeah. to, it has to come out. It has to surface more. Well, like the best example I got from a, a guy that has, you know, that has that dog in him. We were both in Miami for the Monday night game, right? Mm -hmm. And you probably know where I'm going with this. After the game, Titans come back. They win the game. DeAndre Hopkins has seven catches for 124 yards and a touchdown. That dude, after the game, like you would have, like first when I asked the first question, I could kind of read it in his eyes of like, do they just lose or do they just win? Like he's re he's ready to go. He's ready to get to yeah. the next thing. Like yeah. he just and it was like he was a good sport about it. He answered our questions, but like you could just tell he's like, yeah. I don't got time for this. It. I'm yep. ready to. Uh, yep. I am ready to focus on what's next. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, I looked at you and you looked at me. We were like, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yep. like okay. Uh, another example is Cal man Calvin Ridley, certified. Oh. K nine. Oh. That and X-ray. Those... You know what it said. The way he reacted to some of those questions, and I, I wish I you were in it. the building and got to ask him a question and like have him look at you and feel that energy. Yeah. Man, I that, was like, yo. Yeah. That guy, like, listening to it. Like, he and D-Hop both have that, you about to F around and find out. Yeah. Like that, and that's, it's two different levels. Of like, right, right, right. Like, D-Hop is, like, yeah, laid back, you know Kind of I mean? chill about it. But he's, like, he's silent assassin. Yeah, yeah. Like, everybody used to say that about Steve McNair. That, like, really? Steve McNair was the silent, the silent assassin. Like, mm -hmm. you just kind of knew it was that coming. he didn't have much to say, but... He was about to carve you up yeah. with what he did. To me, that's what it, what excites me for Will Levis is knowing that I got DeAndre Hopkins on one side, Calvin Ridley on the other, and then you got Traylon Burks that's kind of like, hey, what about me? Look at me. To me, if all that works out and they their competition within each other, like a healthy competition with the within you know between the the three of them, that's good. Real that's good. real good. Real good. And, and then you bring want. in a young, you know, some young buck that you, you get from the draft. Ooh, they bring in Xavier to get. You know that's my dude. <laughs> You've sold me on him, and I am like man, man crush on man, that kid. He, yeah, he's another one of those TD certified uh, uh, prospects. His man. voice does not fit <laughs> what no. I thought he was. <laughs> he, told, he sounds like he's 70 years old. Yeah, right? you I know. know. What I mean? Sitting on a stoop, you, you know, with his friends listening to the radio. But no, I mean the way he plays, though. So, Ooh, I you add him to them, and, and like the more the more I I think about it, the, the less I feel like they're going to end up with him just because yeah. of the way things are going to. Yep. He's shake another out. one of those fifty first round prospects. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah, he would be awesome. Tron Davenport, Chase McCabe, with you today, hanging out as uh, Jared has the day off. Uh, Venerable baseball was supposed to play today. And with a 545 pregame, that game uh, has been moved to tomorrow. There's going to be a doubleheader tomorrow with Vandy Baseball. So wanted to pass that along. Coming up next, 16-game point streak continues. 
How about those Preds? We'll get into them next. Ugh. Chase and TD, 102.5, 106.3 the game.
Silman and Company, 1025-1063, the game. Chase McCabe, Tron Davenport in today. Chase and TD for Jared, who has the day off. He'll be back on Monday. And I, I'm I'm a little bummed he's not here because I can't brag on my Middle Tennessee State Blue Raiders. The women's team beat his Louisville Cardinals 71-69 in the NCAA tournament. At 11 over a 6 seems to be a trend. Congratulations to uh, Coach Rick Ensel and his crew uh, getting it done in uh, the Albany Regional as they beat Louisville. What a win. That's awesome. TD, uh, we've had some fun talking uh, you know, a little Titans, but shifting gears now, the Predators' 16-game point streak. Not only did they go into South Florida last night and beat the Florida Panthers, but they shut them out mm. 3 nothing. which just, I mean, Kevin Lankinen standing on his head, a great night. Both goaltenders have been fantastic. You know that they're going to ride UC Soros into the playoffs, but Lankin and his has certainly been a key piece. Like that's you got to have you got to have two goalies. Yeah. That you know, was to his get first shutout season. too, right? Uh, I think it was his was first, it his first one this yeah. year with the with the Preds. It was his first. Was year. it really? Yeah, I didn't know that. I think it was his third career first with the Preds. Wow. Well, Lanky in the pipe has been very very good <laughs> uh, when he has uh, come in for UC Soros, but. They continue this, the point streak. They establish a new franchise record yep. for the point streak. And uh, Philip Forsberg continues to do Philip Forsberg things uh, with a two-goal night. Now two away from 40. He's at 38, 77 points overall. Uh, the Preds are, as the kids say, a wagon. Right yeah, now. yeah, they're a wagon for sure. And the thing that's interesting is the way that they're dominating, right? As you mentioned, the 16-point streak. But you look over that time, it's the largest point differential in the league. 68 to 29 so that's something else and just to throw a couple other numbers at you they're they have the highest average goals per game at 4.2 the fewest goals allowed at 1.8 so you're just looking at a complete thing and it's just crazy because like I follow from afar right so I don't necessarily get into the nuts and bolts of what goes on with the Predators but I listen you know when when I'm listening to our shows and stuff like that and it's just really interesting the way the conversation has shifted yeah. to where before I was talking about okay well what should this team do next year you know the trade de trade deadline like should they unload what should cuz if I'm not mistaken there was talk about you know trading sorrows and, yeah. and, you know oh, what yeah. I mean uh so you got that but now it's like wait a minute yeah I think they could – actually, they're right now the the top wild card team, and I, I, I think they could go deep in the playoffs. It's crazy how the narrative has, has shifted. Yeah, it, and it, it really has. Um, it's been fun to watch. What's interesting is I feel like this is the first time in a while that you can actually sit here and you can say that, like, the, the Predators and the Titans are almost kind of on, you know, a, a similar trajectory. And what I mean by that is – the Titans got to a point where they had to realize that it was time to make a change. Mm -hmm. And it was it, it it was time to let Ryan Tannehill, Derrick Henry, Kevin Byard, you know, the old guard, the old core go. And as tough as that is, you never want to see that come to an end. It was the right move. And yeah. and you can you can almost say that maybe they did it, you know, a year after they should have. You know, they they could have done it sooner. The Predators got to that point at the trade deadline last year when they came to the realization it's just not working anymore yeah. and it made some tough decisions. David Poyle had made the decision to retire. They got lucky in that Barry Trotz, who was familiar with the organization, the first coach, was going to come in and take over as the GM. I don't think anybody thought right. that, you know, after buying out Matt Duchesne, trading Ryan Johansson and keeping, you know, a lot of the money, they had already traded a bunch of dudes at the at the deadline. You sign Ryan O'Reilly, you sign, sign Gus Nyquist, you make good signings like, you know, like a Cushionberry that's important and coming in here. Mm -hmm. You're bringing in good culture guys. You make the coaching change. Nobody thought that it would come together as as quickly as it has, and obviously, it's really come together over the course of the last month on this uh, 16 game run. But I just remember everybody asked me at the start of the season, "How do you think the Predators are going to be?" I have no clue. I just think they're going to be fun to watch. Yeah. You know, it's going to be a different type of offense. I think Forsberg's really going to be able to shine. You know, he's been healthy, knock on wood. And 
It has. Brunette has changed the culture. Like, he has brought in a different culture. And and it's like, whenever you say stuff like that, it's kind of like Brian Callahan, the hope is, all right, he's going to come in, he's going to change the vibe. It's mm-hmm. not that Vrabel did anything wrong. It's not that Vrabel had a bad vibe. It's not that John Hines had a bad vibe. It's yeah. just sometimes it, it was time for a different paint. voice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, the more I look back on the Titans and their decision, as much as I could have made the argument to keep Vrabel to, to, to try another year, to let him be a part of this rebuild, or let, let him you know fix some things that weren't all his fault, at the same time, if you're going to do it, just do a clean slate. Just yeah, and yeah. and and that's what Trotz decided to do. That's what Rand decided to do, and Amy started decided to do. It's working for the Preds. Time will tell, you know, if it does for the Titans, and time will tell how deep of a run this is actually going to be for the Preds. The important thing with this is you mentioned how in the beginning of the season you're like, I don't know what they were bad, man. They were. I mean, five, yeah, what five and ten, to start, right? And it's like. Oh, man, this is another rebuilding year. I think Titans fans have to have the same. Sure. Look. Like if, they, if that's – I don't know what the schedule is going to be, but let's say they have two tough games coming out the bat and they start 0-2. Don't line up on the pedestrian bridge and jump off. Just <laughs> just hold up for a second and let the season play out. Obviously, there's a lot less games. Yeah. But I think this Predators season is a good example of how things could work. And I, I just – I think – Another thing with the Predators that I really like is just the game experience they provide. You know, oh, yeah. You, you get the power play and they play that DMX, lose oh, my yeah. mind. The guys square up in the race, start fighting, they play the crazy heavy metal music. Like, it's yeah. an, a total experience. And then when they score the goal, was it Toby Keith they play, I think? No, it was? it's uh, Tim McGraw. Tim McGraw, excuse yeah. me. Tim McGraw part, part and of my then country, the Black Keys, ignorant. which is a, they're a local band. Yeah, you know, and then they right show now. the replay and everything. Like, yeah. It's a dope experience. Yeah. Like, I don't know hockey that well. But I want to go to games. Sure. You know what I mean? And I think they've done a great job of it. Well, and I think that's something that they have done a really good job, and the league has done a good job of, of trying to get new fans in. Mm-hmm. You know, that like mm-hmm. people that didn't grow up with it or didn't, you know, I don't know how many Flyers games you ever went to in Philly. Very, or, they're hard. To, it's like yeah. next to impossible to go to. Those. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, like, you know, it, it they they were good at, at building a fan base. Mm-hmm. And, like, you're seeing Nashville SC kind of go through that right now. Yeah. In building a fan base, but now it's just like you got everybody that has stuck through it and knew, like, hey, let's this will be a, a process. And what's also been cool to see is Barry Trotz has adjusted that process as he like he realized at the trade deadline, well, my team's playing pretty damn good, so maybe I don't need to mess it up too much. Thank and he ad- he added a couple of pieces that fit the mold that they already had. Yeah, and you know because you got to have depth for the run, like. We've talked to different national voices. Greg Wyshynski comes on the Chasing Big Joe show every week. And he's like, if I'm one of these teams in the West, like a Vancouver or Winnipeg, I don't want Nashville in the first round. Mm-hmm. Like, even though I'm the higher seed, they're coming in there just Catch like. lightning in the bottle. Yeah, and they have that. I always use the analogy. After that 9-2 loss, it's kind of like they look at themselves in the mirror and they see the blood coming down their lip. You know, and their black eye, and it's like I just got my butt beat, and it's like you just get that pissed off look on you, just like <laughs> okay, all right, pick yourself up, and then you get back in the fight. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then it becomes the oh, you should see the other guy. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and that's that's kind of where they're at, and I I just love the mentality that they have right now. Yeah, no, and that's that's the thing, and just if they could continue to to hold on to that that streak. And obviously, you know, this is an unprecedented streak for the franchise, so I'm not saying continue to have that type, but continue to win and, and, and get those points in the column. You know, again, leading that into the playoffs, that momentum is a thing, and uh, that's something that they could have. No doubt about it. We will get Corey Curtis's thoughts on this, News 2 Sports Director. He will join us next on a Fireball Hot Take Friday, as he always does uh, on Fridays at 3.15. Chase and TD in today for Stillman and Company, 102.5, 106.3, the game.
Stillman and company, Chase McCabe, Teron Davenport in today for Jared Stillman on a Fireball Hot Take Friday. We say hello now to Corey Curtis, News 2 Sports Director, joins every Friday at 315. Corey, what's up? How are you? I am adequate, fellas. How are you today? Doing fantastic. I want to start on the ice because this Predators team has just... My goodness. We all saw it coming, right? I mean, like 16-game point streak. You, you've you obviously known Barry Trotz for a long time, mm-hmm. just just like I have. I mean, I think we knew this was going to work. I just didn't expect it to work as quickly as it has. And obviously, we got to see what happens with the playoffs and, and getting into the playoffs. But it just feels like he's come in here and, and truly reinvented the Predator way with the help of Andrew yeah. Burnett. And the guys have bought in. it, right? Yeah. He energized it. Just, I mean, and it's isn't it amazing how you can point to – one moment where sure. it all turned. I mean, and with this team, you absolutely can point to that one moment. Do you guys realize it's been almost 40 days since they lost in regulation? I know. I know. That is, I mean, that's an eternity. I mean, that's forever. It's unbelievable. And it, Wayne Beggerly, my former um, director, um, was at the game last night, yeah. and they still won. They can win under any circumstances. That guy's the biggest black cat I've ever known. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing stops them. I mean, I, look, if they were going to lose a game, I thought last night was really going to be it. You know, um, they just tied the record. Florida's really good. You got all the attention on Burnett. And I was like, this is, this is a tough one. And I look up and they're up 2 nothing. They just, they, and just look at the way they scored last night. I mean, I know Phillip had the deflection, but the two others were just flat out effort in front of the net and they've got the hats now that say relentless and that is what they are all about and the only question i've got at this point is how long can they sustain this level of effort because it's it's a really high intensity level that they're putting out right now well and Corey, that kind of leads me into my next point i i think it's as long as the goaltending to con- continues to play the way that it is and it's not just yeah. soros lankanen has been lights out when his number's been called and it's not a whole lot, but I mean, he gets in there and it's they don't miss a beat. No, no, and and the, the other nice thing is, is you, you certainly don't want to see any of them get hurt. But if you have to call up the kid from Milwaukee, you're really not worried about missing a beat there either. No, I mean they're I mean in the pipes they are in a a really really good spot, and it, and it helps to maybe have the best defenseman in the world on your team right now. I mean, look, we talk about Barry Trotz and being here and knowing him a long time. We've been watching Roman Yossi a long time. I don't know that I've ever seen him play better hockey than he's playing right now. He is otherworldly right now. Corey, if you look right now, like they're the first wild card team. Um, yeah. You compare it to the 2017, they were the second wild card team. They they made the run to the cup finals. Do you see similarities in, in, in the two teams just as far as like how there were moves that were made to set them up before the year, in this case, you know, during the year, et cetera? Yeah, I, I think, TD, I think you're exactly right. Um, because when you look at that team back then, you know, lines three and four in particular were very young. Um, and they just, they kind of had, they kind of had pieces and, you know, those guys, I mean, by the time they got to the cup finals, Colton Sissons was their number one center because they'd had so many injuries. Um, but the young guys delivered the first line delivered. That was, you know, the Forsberg, Johansson, you know, James Neal, um, those guys, they, they delivered. But then all those, those other lines did all of the, the, the effort work and the grunt work, and, and they got it done. And, you know, this team looks – I try not to draw that comparison because that team went to the cup final, and it's, but, but it looks more and more like it all the time. And, you know, you bring up being a wild card, I, I don't think it matters. I think all that matters this time of the year is how you're playing and what your matchup is. Um, because I've seen too many eight seeds either get to the final or win it all. I mean, shoot, the L.A. Kings got in on the last day and won it all. So it's just a matter of getting there and how you're playing and who you match up against. And, you know, look, this team could go one and done in the playoffs, and it would still be a great year. I mean, it would be disappointing if they didn't play well in that series. Um, but, you know, I think I, I look at what's going to happen this year in hopes that it builds up for next year to kind of reveal – maybe where you need a little bit more. Corey Curtis is with us here on Stillman and Company on a a Fireball Hot Take Friday. Let's shift to uh, basketball. Tennessee, 
convincing win, and it should have been a convincing win. Now they'll uh, face Rick Barnes' former team in the Texas mm-hmm. Longhorns. Uh, I'm of the belief that you know if they get to the Elite Eight and they get beat by Purdue in the Elite Eight, while that's not ideal, I'll take it. I get it. It's a good team. Well, but to me – Purdue's the number one seed, so – Right, yeah. right. So I, I, can, I can live with that. But anything okay. beyond that is a failure in my mind on Who, Rick who's Barnes. Who's the two seed? Uh, Tennessee. No, they're the three. Oh, they are the two. That's right. Yeah, they are yeah. the two. Okay. Creighton's yeah, right. the three. So, Creighton's the Look, guys, Creighton's really good. Creighton is really good. I, I, I mean, agree. You could, you, you could play a great game against Creighton and lose. And and I understand what you're saying. They've got to get to the Sweet 16, and, it's, you know, they, they need to beat Texas. I mean, Texas was in a straight-up rock fight last night with Colorado State. That game set basketball back. Um, <laughs> the only thing that saved it was Virginia's <laughs> performance. I mean, I was. I mean, how long did Colorado State go without scoring? Like fourteen minutes or something. I'm like, these guys are all on scholarship. I mean, come on, somebody put the ball in the hole. Mm-hmm. But you know, look, Tennessee. I like the way they responded last night after their loss here in Nashville. I thought, you know, with a smashing performance, I thought it was really, really good. If the big guy inside can play well, you know, the, the guys that are the X factors though are 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 are, are uh, Jordan and. Um, in Vescovy and like, cause sometimes they disappear and they're too old and too experienced to disappear. And so they need those guys to be contributors so that it's not all on Sakai and not all on Dalton. Cause when you start seeing everybody just stand around watching Dalton, that's when I go, uh Oh, you know, they, 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 like he can still score 30, but they still need to be a team. And when they're a team, they're, they're tough to beat. Corey got to get the Titans in there. So, yeah. Jarius, uh, Legarius Sneed, the mm-hmm. trade talks, the rumors. What's your take on everything going on? You know, um, it's a massive retooling, and I'm I, I'm glad they're not willing to deal a pick this year that they don't really have because they. Mm-hmm. I mean, you'd have to overpay, and they need more young talent, or they're going to get sideways on the cap again. Um, but I don't mind dipping into next year's if you can bring in a four year starter. Um, you know, I think that that. I'm I'm okay with that, um, and it's been a long time since I've seen a lockdown corner, so I'm okay with paying one as well. I like the aggressiveness. I like you know, look, even if the trade doesn't happen, I like the fact that they're involved. Right. All right, they're, they're they're kicking the tires on everything, trying to become uh, a better football team. You've already added um, really good about what you got back there, and so I mean, you know, we talk about the improvements of the offense, and and look. You know, you're not going to be able to fill all the holes, all right? But, you know, when you can fill a hole that you know is going to be filled for like four years, and I'm a big believer that you got to pay for quality sometimes, you know? You get what you pay for. And, you know, like when you try to cut corners on stuff, it, it usually reveals itself. And they can continue to try to corner their way on a budget, or they can get – a really good football player. And, you know, I, I don't know how you guys feel. I, I kind of feel like I expect them to pull this off. I, I don't know. That's kind of the way I feel. It, it does feel that way. It, it, it does. We just have to see what the conversation is. But yeah. that being said, okay, he wants to be paid as the top corner. Yeah. More yeah. more than Jair Alexander. Now, I don't know that I – well, it, it would be interesting. Nevertheless – They all want to. Right. right? Sure. My, my question to you is this. This is a guy who apparently didn't practice during training camp last year because of knee issues yeah. and has had okay. them throughout the, the year. Mm-hmm. Are you still willing to do that knowing that? Um, I want to know what his history of knee injuries are. Yeah. Um, to see if this was just a last year thing or if this is a chronic thing. And, and I wouldn't, you know, you, obviously you have to take a physical for the, for the trade to go through. Um, so, I mean, I think the history is really important that if it's a one-off or not. But if he can play like he played last year on a bad knee, then he's absolutely worth the money if he's going to play on two good ones this year. Facts. It's going to be interesting to see what they end up doing. Uh, it is a fireball hot take Friday. What is your hot take? I, I kind of alluded to it. Um, but, you know, look, we all live on Twitter, and it's, there's a lot of knee-jerk reactions, especially from the show you're on. Um, but, um, but I, I just, I want to tell everybody, relax. 
They're not going to fix it all in one year. A roster is a living, breathing, evolving thing. You're continually looking to add pieces younger, cheaper, faster, stronger. And, and, you, and, you know, it doesn't all come together in the first 10 days of free agency. So you just, you know, enjoy the pieces that have been added and, and watch and wait. You still have the draft. More players are going to be released, you know, and, and the team's not going to be perfect when you get to the fall. There were too many holes to fill them all, okay? And I know we all, you know, want them all to be filled, but just because guys are out there doesn't mean you have to go pay them. All right, you got to pay the right guys. And I'd rather, I'd rather not have a guy than write another bad contract. All right, we've seen a few of those, and they really can set you back. And so I, I guess my cautionary tale here is, is the team is working. All right, Rand and his staff are working. They are bringing in players. They have brought in players, and they are obviously continuing to look to do it. So relax. All right, it's it, it'll be okay. I thought you were going to take that with uh, you know when you're talking about knee jerk reactions. You know, relax, Kentucky fans. You know, you're not going to fire <laughs> Calipari. But see, it's not knee jerk there. I mean, you've no. got a pattern of early exits now. Oh and, yeah. You know that. So that's you know if if they, look, he's won a ton of games and he's been a fantastic coach for years. But winning 25 games isn't the metric, isn't the barometer at Kentucky. It's where do you finish in the tournament, all right? If he won 18 games during the season and went to the Final Four, they would be just fine, all right? But, but he's not winning in March, and he's losing to embarrassing teams. And so I understand the embarrassment and the frustration. And frankly, you're paying too much to lose to Oakland. Oh, yeah. I mean, look, he hasn't been to a Final Four since 2015 and only yeah, one national title to show for it. And, it, you know, and most most of the people, I think, are like you're saying, they're they're kind of done with him. But, you know, sometimes there's the argument of, well, it's a, it's a hard tournament to win. Uh, Coach K it, it got, is. what, five titles. Roy Williams had three. Well, look, the guy you gave up 32 to last night – Played Division Two basketball for four years, averaging nine points a game. Yeah, he looked like right. he's thirty-seven. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, he almost <laughs> put up thirty-seven. All yeah. right. So you couldn't stop. You couldn't stop a Division Two player. There was no way for you at some point in that game to shut down a Division Two player. I mean, that's that's just kind of ridiculous. And look, I, like I said, I respect Coach Calipari. He's won a ton of games. He's put a ton of guys in the NBA. He's a really good coach, but he is not getting it done in March and that's the barometer at Kentucky. And so that's it. And you're right. Those other coaches, they all found ways to win in March. And I know he's got, a, and you know, maybe the problem is, is he's got so many one and dones that he can't get his teams. You know, it doesn't work together. anymore. The one, the yeah. one and dones don't work anymore. In, in yeah, my maybe, maybe, maybe you mix the one and dones with the transfer portal and create more of a team. Yep. hundred percent. Corey, good to talk to you. Thanks, man. All right. All right. You guys have a good one. Good luck on your brackets. Yeah, you too. Corey Curtis, News 2, joining us here on Stillman & Company. Chase and TD in today for Jared, who has the day off. He'll be back on Monday. We will talk a little tournament coming uh, coming up next here on Stillman & Company, 102.5, 106.3 The Game.
We made some critical mistakes at critical times again today. I mean, we had our chances. As good as they played and as many shots as they made, we still had our chances. When you have a really young team and you look at where did the mistakes come from, they were freshmen. They had performed on the road in hostile environments that I didn't expect some of the stuff today. There you go. That was John Calipari yesterday, last night, after losing to Oakland. Chasing TD, Teron Davenport, in today for Jared Stillman on this Friday. And I heard that, TD, and I was just like, typical. Yeah. Blaming your team, not taking responsibility. And once again, an early exit in March for the Kentucky Wildcats. Just Unbelievable. And I, look, I'm not a Kentucky fan by any means. In fact, I'm kind of an anti Kentucky fan. But I said it this morning on my show. John Calipari is the most overrated coach in college basketball, and Kentucky is the most overrated program in college basketball. They are a blue blood, and at one time they were. But I mean, three championships in 30 years. That's it. That's what you got. And, and I mean, I think the, you know, you sit there and you count Final Fours. Okay, great. All right, I'll give you that. 2015, it's been nine years. That's the last time that they've been. And we we had a texter come at me and go, well, like, if you're saying that they're overrated for three titles in 30 years, then, you know, Tennessee's got one in 50 years in football, so are they overrated too? Well, Their expectations are exactly, a hell of a lot different. Exactly. <laughs> That's the difference. And it's not only expectations, but their – reputation i guess you could say or yeah. like the the energy like the titans aren't considered one or excuse me tennessee isn't considered one of the the top programs no. in the like you as you mentioned blue bloods they're not a blue not, i mean yeah they're a historic program but it's but, like when well, you mentioned college basketball duke north carolina kansas kansas yukon yukon Kentucky comes up. Yeah. And it's like, At one time Indiana, you know, yeah. one time UCLA. Yeah, one time Syracuse. One time Syracuse. Mellow you know. in the crew. But yeah, right. to your point, though. Yeah. It just, and so it's apples and oranges in my mind. Kentucky, with what they pay John Calipari, should be a perennial favorite. And when you're actually a perennial favorite, you got to do something with that. I'm not saying you have to win the championship every year, it is a hard tournament to win. I get it. I couldn't tell you. I mean, I picked North Carolina to win this year. They're probably not going to. Who knows who's yeah. going to win it? But, like, and I, I get it that it's gotten even harder with playing the portal game and, you know, still one and dones and things like that. That's why, well, you you know, you got Villanova that's been in there, uh, you know, and, and done, it, done a really good, yeah. good job. Um, you know, Virginia got theirs a few years ago. I mean, there are different teams that get in there, and we love seeing that. But at some point, it should always circle back to those teams we just named. And, it, and it, it usually does, except Kentucky isn't in the mix. Yeah, they're not in the mix. And, I mean, you look like UConn, they're, as expected, you know, they're already out to a huge lead over Stetson. But that's a good example of a program that went through a major change, right, but they still managed to emerge and, and, and be a top-level program because they won a title under their, their new coach. You know, so I think – when you look at Kentucky, you got Calipari who's been there. And it's funny, I can never – and if Chris Sanders is listening, he's going to stop and crack up because I can never think of Calipari without thinking of John Chaney and that press <laughs> oh, call. That's he a said, classic. He said, I'll kill you. That's, yeah, that, <laughs> it had me classic. dying. But, you know, you look at the reputation that he's established too as far as like sending guys to the league one and done and that type of thing. You wouldn't think that it's been that long since he's won a national championship. I didn't even think of like I thought it was more recent than 2015 until you mentioned that. Yeah, it's it, well, I it kind of shocked me too when I looked yeah. it up. I was like, it's been nine years. Nine years since they've been to the to the final, even the final four, and over I think it's twelve years since they won the national championship. Um, Auburn leads Yale right now, ten to five. About three minutes into that game, uh, a couple other scores. Uh, Western Kentucky they 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 gave them a game, but ultimately fell. Uh, we'll give you the score there in just a second. But uh, let's see, Clemson all over New Mexico, fifty one thirty three in the second half. UConn destroying Stetson, fifty two nineteen in the second half. They needed overtime 
Northwestern beats FAU 77-65. I really thought FAU was going to get out of that one. Yeah, that overtime, um, Northwestern went bonkers, man. Yeah. Uh, Baylor beats Colgate 92-67. Um, San Diego State beats UAB 69-65, a good one there. Marquette, as I mentioned, did roll over uh, Western Kentucky 87-69, pulled away there at the end. Uh, just about to tip off. Uh, or just tipped off, I should say. Florida leads Colorado seven five. That should be a good game. I really like Florida going in. I think Florida got hot at the right time going into this tournament. Uh, as you got Duke in Vermont a little bit later on. Nebraska, Texas A and M a little bit later on. As you get into the night session, Alabama plays tonight. Purdue plays tonight. Um, so far today, no upsets. Right, no upsets. But you talk about later games, man. You're not, you're not going to mention my pick, Houston. Oh, LJ you got Cryer Houston. and the crew. Houston and Longwood. Yeah, tonight. So you yeah. got Houston winning it all. Yeah, I got Houston winning it all. I don't think that's yeah. a bad pick. Yeah, it's it's. I, I went through and I was looking at it. I, I had uh, Houston and Marquette uh, with Houston coming out of there, and then Tennessee beating Purdue. Uh, I do have uh, Tennessee beating Purdue. Purdue is interesting. Uh, I can I always forget the 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 center's name. But he's like seven, seven three or something crazy like that. The, the center that Edie. Purdue had, Edie, yeah. yeah. Uh, so he's obviously going to be something they have to figure it out. But I like Tennessee's inside outside game, and I think you know between their guard play and and their play down low, I think they could they could overcome Purdue. I'm gonna give you the upset, an oh, upset oh. pick for tonight. Okay, here we go. What I really really like, James Madison over Wisconsin, Ooh. twelve over a five. JMU. I like James Madison over Wisconsin. Okay. Another one that I might take a flyer on, um, and it has a, a familiar name too uh, at head coach, but uh, I like Grand Canyon. I think Grand Canyon uh, in St. Mary's, I think that'll be a good game. St. Mary's is a five-and-a-half-point favorite. But I like, I like Grand Canyon. Bryce Drew, former Vanderbilt basketball coach, done a really nice job there with Grand Canyon. What happened with him and, and Vanderbilt? Why didn't that last? Well, he was there three years. He had – his last year was they went over in the SEC. Just terrible, okay. terrible year. And that was – was that 2018? 18 or 19, I can't remember. Um, but they got a new athletic director, and he had come from the G League, had been running the G League – Really like Stackhouse, and so I I think he just saw that as an opportunity to make make the change, right? And bring um, some star power and, and brought brought in Stackhouse. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so Vanderbilt, you know, I who knows their future head coach could be one of these guys that has gotten his team into a tournament. I I mean, look, people joke. Bryce Drew's done a really good job. Yeah, at Grand I mean, Canyon. We're talking like about Grand I, Canyon. I I know. You know what I mean? Yeah. Wow. I wouldn't I wouldn't hate that. Like, I wouldn't hate it if they brought him back. They're not going to, but I, I wouldn't hate it. So, mm. it'll be interesting to kind of see um, what they do. But uh, other games tonight, TCU-Utah State, that's the 8-9 matchup. So, another good night of college hoops with the tournament. I always get into it. Like I said, today I haven't gotten to watch as much. We got Auburn and Yale on, and then Florida and Colorado. Florida up 13-10 um, just a few minutes into that game. So pretty good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's always it's exciting, man. You know. Yeah, always get into it. And so you went. All right, who you got in your final four? You got your bracket right here. So you went UConn, Carolina, Houston, Tennessee. You got Tennessee in the final four. Mm -hmm. Okay, got them beating Purdue, man. Yeah, there you go. And then Houston wins it all. All right, I like that. He's Toronto Davenport, Chase McCabe in today for Jared Stillman. Tune in to ninety four nine The Fan today. As Vanderbilt women's basketball takes on the Baylor Bears in the women's NCAA tournament pregame at 4:45 with the tip-off at five. Coverage also available on the 94.9 The Fan app and 94.9TheFan.com. We've already had uh, one uh, Middle Tennessee school, and it was Middle Tennessee State University defeating the Louisville Cardinals 71-69. Uh, I did text Jared, and I said, "My school beat your school." Did he watch? Uh, I don't know if you watched or not. His response was, "That's okay. We had a down year." <laughs> <laughs> so that was uh that was what he had to say there so looking forward to seeing what shay ralph and uh, the vanderbilt commodores women's team can do it is stillman and company on this fireball hot take friday 615-737-1025 
That's our phone and text line driven by Wilson County Hyundai.com. Jason TD in for Jared today, 1025-1063, the game. We're going to do kind of a state of the Titans, where they are at this point. A lot of different angles uh, in the 4 o'clock hour. So looking forward to that. What else they can do at free agency, obviously bring up the draft, but just where they kind of are in their rebuild. 
you know, I used to be afraid of that word and like, cause you know, GMs and coaches, they don't like using that word, but it's like, that's what it is. So just, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, you got to kind of, you know, just say what it is. You know, the predators, I guess were in that for about five minutes and then it became a retool, but, um, Quickly. you know, and so look, sometimes there are examples in sport, the Houston Texans, while yes, they had years of being bad and years of, you know, high draft picks and. Obviously, they parlayed that into, you know, two of the first three picks in last year's draft that they ended up landing the best offensive player and the best defensive player. It created a quicker turnaround. Mm. And they got the right head coach, too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He, the culture was yeah. flipped. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, D'Amico, Ryan, D'Amico Ryan's, like, bringing him in a just fantastic hire. And so mm. you saw it turn around as quickly as it did. Yeah, no, without a doubt, you saw a turnaround. And, you know, Bobby Slowick being in there also, you know, was a big part and just – That's a big win for them to keep him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's something to be said about energy, right? And that's that's what he, he brought. And just making the guys feel like, you know, you are you are of quality. You know what I mean? And I think just that confidence really was there with him. Yeah. So, so um, we'll do more of that. With the Titans, the, the Predators, back in action tomorrow against the Detroit Red Wings uh, at, at Bridgestone Arena. Four o'clock puck drop, three o'clock pregame with Max Hers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, important. I mean, they're all important, but like Detroit's a team that's fighting for a playoff spot. So you're going to get a, a playoff type atmosphere tomorrow at Bridgestone Arena because you got a team that is trying to hold their spot in the playoffs in the West, a team that's, you know, trying to make a run to the playoffs in the East uh, and two teams that obviously have some history when they used to be in the same division. I think it's going to be a fun playoff type atmosphere tomorrow at Bridgestone, which I love games like that. Yeah. Yeah. And just those playoff atmosphere type of environments are, are so fun because you could feel the stakes and you could just like when something good happens, the way the crowd roars is just different. Oh yeah. You know, and, and the vibe and everything. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that ends up being, um, Obviously won't be in in the stands, but you know it'd be cool just to to watch it at the very least. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's certainly gonna. I mean, it's just a fun time of year with this team right now. By the way, Yale has battled back. They now lead Auburn seventeen sixteen thirteen thirty to go in the first half. Uh, now eighteen sixteen after hitting some free throws. I got to tell you, I feel like Auburn's gonna make a run. I love Bruce Pearl, always have, um, but definitely not an ideal start right now still a long way to go 13 against the four but um you know auburn's a team i have going pretty deep yeah yeah no auburn is definitely a, a team to watch i have them dropping the yukon but um you, you have them beating yukon and going no i didn't have them okay. beating yukon so sweet 16 yeah i'm going to the okay. sweet 16 so um and then florida leads colorado 24 14 yeah early in that game and again florida is another team that i like so uh, representing the the S the SEC, <coughs> got to see uh, Florida and Auburn play a little bit last week at Bridgestone Arena. So that oh, was did fun. you? Yeah, yeah. I went you over know, what? I need to start going there. To we'll that get SEC you. We'll tournament. get you in there. I, 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 I think you could have some there. fun watching yeah. the SEC tournament. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, look, love sports. Period. So sure, yeah. sure. It's. I mean, it's just. It's cool to see because you know you get that team. Well, and and l- last week was kind of a. A shocker because you had Tennessee go out early, you had Kentucky go out early, and those were the two that everybody thought it was going to end up being them. And so Auburn ends up winning it all, uh, and obviously helped their their status as now they've regained the lead up twenty eighteen, uh, twelve twenty five to go. So always a you know certainly a, a fun time for sure. But coming up next, Chase and TD in today for Jared Stillman, the state of the Titans, where TD and I think they are right now at this point in the off season, obviously still an incomplete still have the draft to go we'll look at a lot of different aspects to this and what they can do moving forward you can also weigh in at any time on what we're talking about 615-737-1025 that's our phone and text line driven by wilson county you can tune in to 94 9 the fan this sunday for coverage of the echo park automotive grand prix from circuit of the americas better known as coda nascar action coverage will begin at 1 30 the race starting at 2.30. Coverage also available on the 94.9 The Fan app and 94.9thefan.com.
Chase and TD in for Stillman and Company today. 1025-1063, the game. Teron Davenport, I'm Chase McCabe. Ian Safar on the ones and twos. Ian, I haven't asked you how you're doing yet. I'm sorry. What's up? I'm great. How are you guys? You know what? We're good. We're having fun. Rocking and rolling. Rockin Sounding and great rolling. today. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, State of the Titans. 615-737-1025. I have a feeling we're going to get some pretty good interaction on this. Where they are at right now. And... I look at this as the process is not done yet. And I, I like what you said of, hey, if this year, you know, because I, I, a few weeks ago, Joe and I did this a little bit and, and said, like, you know, with what they've done so far, where do you have their win totals at? And I, I have them at, like, five or six still, you know, mm-hmm. still some time. The defense concerns me because yeah. they've had to throw a lot into the offense, which they should have. But – you know, you, you have Jeffrey Simmons up front, and that's really about it. Um, you know, they just brought in Sebastian Joseph, which I guess he prefers Sebastian Joseph over Sebastian Joseph Day. So now it's it's it was clarified that Sebastian Joseph, he does that for personal, like, documents and stuff like okay. that. But he wants is Sebastian Joseph Day okay. for so media it, stuff. Gotcha. So they bring him in. Um, obviously, they've signed uh, Wuzier. Yeah. Ooh, Ooh, I like it. <laughs> They've signed him. Still need another corner. Yeah. You know, maybe it's Legarius Sneed, maybe it's not. Yeah. So there's a lot of work still to be done. And then they gotta go into the draft. Right. And and I look at the draft as I'd really like to see, you know, Rand do some wheeling and dealing and figure out a way to get a third round pick. Because mm-hmm. I feel like there's a lot of meat on that bone. A lot. In the third round, whether it's receiver <sighs> Or offensive line, maybe DBs. You know, I mean, I yeah. just I feel like you can find some some pretty good stuff there in the third round. So, yeah. if you can figure out a way to get a ticket to that party, I'm I'm all about it. Yeah, you look at that round, and that's when your Malachi Corley's your he may even go earlier, frankly, but that's where those types of guys come in. Your Cam Hearts, your those types, right? Your your, your Cam Kinchins, like if you yeah. want to get a, a a safety, I think he may be there in the third round. It'd be a stretch, but uh, you know, if you could get an early third round pick, you're in really good yeah. position. And coming off of that seventh overall pick is not a totally bad thing. There are so many players that are going to get pushed down because of this quarterback market. Because you also push in. Uh, J.J. McCarthy, and now you got four guys that, you know, they're going to be in that tie that's going to push down prospects. You got uh, – no one's talking about uh, Latu, Latu, right, out, out of uh, – he's an outstanding pass rusher, you, you know what I mean, a UCLA guy. You got Jarrett Verse, nobody's talking about him. You know, there's so many that I think you could get. And then also, you look at that third round, that could also be an area where Brandon Fisk is available too. It, yeah, you know. now somebody was asking about yeah. him earlier. Yeah. Yeah. You really like him. I do like him because when you look at him, it's one of those guys that he's relentless. He never takes a playoff. He's very strong. He's not the most – he's not the biggest tackle, but he's a guy like in, in a 4-3 in a D tackle or 3-4 type of end. He could do that. I just love his athleticism, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I remember on, on that Thursday, the end of the Senior Bowl practices – they had the big dogs lining up as receivers, and he was out there routing them. <laughs> you know, so you like an athletic guy that has a high motor and, and that, you know, just seems to be driven. You know, another guy I like, and you and I have texted about now, I said it earlier, like Xavier Leggett, like that, yeah. that's my dude. X. Like, I yep. am all about him. However, if it doesn't work out that they, they can get him, uh, Pearsall from Florida. <sighs> You like him too? Saucy. Yo, yeah. his routes are stupid. I was watching him down there at the Senior Bowl, and the thing that really – he reminds me of Cooper Cup. Yeah. You know, and I hate to compare a white receiver to another white, white receiver. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like, oh, what? But he really does remind me just because of the, the quickness. Yeah. I think he's a little more athletic than Cooper Cup, though. But just the quickness and the way that – uh, he's able to set his routes up and get in and out of the breaks, and his hands are stupid. Like 
there he could catch that rock. Did you see the, the catch he had, the jump in one oh, hand? Oh, yeah. You know, but beyond that, just the way he catches everything with his hands. And he just has, like, that swagger to him that you want out of a receiver. And I could see him coming in and fitting right in at the slot and doing some things for this Titans team. Um, Skyler says on our text line, driven by WilsonCountyHoney.com, I'm excited to see a new offense. Pass mm-hmm. first, scheming guys open. Seems like Carthon and Callahan want to speed it up, and I like it. Also ready to see Denard Wilson blitzing the defense and bringing his physical style. It may be an up-and-down season, but I like the direction for the next two to three years uh, to come after a few more good drafts. I think that, Skyler, every, everybody should listen to that text. Mm-hmm. Frame it, put it on your wall, and that is the exact attitude that you should yeah. have. Yeah. Because, look, this it's not going to get fixed overnight. Right. And, and and it was never going to get fixed overnight. You know, I think the thing to me that really stands out when I look at kind of the state of the team is, you know, when when they did that press conference after Mike Vrabel got fired, and, you know, I've said it, Rand Carthon was put in a really unfair position. Tough spot. And and he came off not looking good, and it wasn't his fault. And I, I think there's probably some regret behind the scene of how that got handled. But – they, I walked out of that going, they don't know what the hell they're doing. Like, they don't have a plan. They don't, like, you know, it's like, just just tell me what the plan is. Yeah. You don't have a plan. And it's yeah. it's like uh, they did this Twitter account, did this thread of Simpsons clips describing every NFL team. Oh, boy. And we, we, we played on Chasing Big Joe sometimes, but it, it's the one where it's like, we got a lot of really exciting things coming up at Duff. And Homer goes, like what? Well, we can't get into that right now. Why not? <laughs> okay, we're going to be honest. We don't have anything. <laughs> Happy? No. You know, like that. that's kind of what – that's the one they used for that. Yeah. That's how it felt. Fast forward now, I know what the – I feel like I know what the plan is. Like they're building around Will Levis right now. I mean, now you can obviously evaluate this year. You can give him – some weapons and put them in the best possible position to succeed. And you may decide halfway through the year, like, all right, he's not the guy we got to start all over, but hopefully that's not the case. I think he can be the guy. I, I think in the right situation, you know, at the very least could be what you had in a younger version of Tannehill of you surround him with the right pieces. You know, he can do, do some things, but yeah. you got to give it time to play out. Like, the defense, I think they're going to still tweak and is going to get better before the season starts. It's not going to be completely fixed. And, and you got to do on the defensive side of the ball, you're building around Simmons, and that's exactly what you should do. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you can fix that secondary or, or improve the secondary and bring in another corner, whether it's Sneed or you're drafting somebody or both or, or what have you. But you're going to be kind of weak up, up the middle. Yeah. And you kind of you, you kind of have to be prepared for that. Yeah, going you, into you this do. year, you do, and you know the Sneed situation is really interesting because, you know, that's a uh, that's a big time move if they could if they could do it. Obviously, you know, I'm sure you saw the report by Nate Taylor of the Athletic uh, about the the deal being in place uh, this past week, and that's the thing that's so interesting, right? Situations are fluent, right? Initially, right. when free free agency started, the first week uh, of it, the Titans were like, "Hey, look." You want too much, and they yeah. backed off. But what's really intriguing is how other teams backed off too that were in the mix. Now, once those other teams backed off, the Chiefs apparently, according to this report, they yeah they were able to get a deal. You know, so knowing uh, that initially the conversation was too much, and then they were able to get a deal in place apparently, but with Sneed. He's priced himself too high. Priced himself. But the thing that's so crazy to me, and I didn't even realize this till Wednesday talking to Matt Verderon of SI Now, it's not the agent that wants the, the highest paid per year average. It's, right. it's Sneed. And it's just like, I don't understand it. Agents, yeah. they want that average, that high average. Because it helps It them. looks good to them. Yeah. But that number, is it's a, it's a fictional number. Right. That guaranteed money. That's what you want, Jack. That's what you want. That's what you want. So I'm not sure, you know, what's going on with that deal. Here's the thing, and I will never understand this because I'll never be in this position. 
But like, you know, these guys that like, hey, I want to be the highest paid at this position. All right, that's good for your ego. That's that's all that is. Because at the end of the day, you're making a crap ton of money no matter what. And it all, I mean, like, to me, like, you get to a certain point of rich where you're rich no matter what. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, it's kind of like, what's what's the big difference in $20 million and $27 million? Like, not much. Right. It is what it is. It's yeah. all going into your bank account. Like, I, I, I would love to say that I could be in that position one day. But, and I feel like there are guys that they don't care about that. They just... Like, hey, I want to take care of my family. You know, I want to make a good reason. All all that. But I'm here to play ball. And then there's guys that, no, I want to be the highest paid at my position. And it's just like, okay. And and, and we saw it here. Like, Kevin Byard at one point in time became the highest paid safety in the National Football League. Mm -hmm. Do you think he cared about being the highest paid safety in the National Football League? No. Like, wanted to get paid. He just, I wanted to take care of his family. Be paid a you know good wage for what he does, and go out and play ball. And he and he still played at a high level even after he got that contract. Yeah, not everybody's like that, right. unfortunately. And that's and that's the thing that's so cool and about the Calvin Ridley situation because that's something that you know it has been said about him. How is he going to play after he got the deal? Yeah, I think he's going to ball out though, but. It's cool to see a guy have an opportunity to say, you know what, I don't know what you guys were talking about. I got that money, yeah, but I love this game and I'm going to ball. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I I love – again, that goes back to the conversation of do you have dog in you or not. <laughs> a guy with dog in him will get the bag and get the money and then go, hey, watch this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prove all you wrong that say I'm going to take plays off because I got the check. And, you know, I, that's, that's what I love to see. Yeah. And, and eventually, like, Father Time catches up with you, it, and we know that. Undefeated. 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 And, and it's like, it's, like, I remember, I remember, like, I've talked to Derek about this, of, you know, he had times later in his career where it's like, hey, the, mind, the mind's there. The, the, the heart's there, but, you know, maybe he doesn't have that burst mm-hmm. like he used to. And, like, you look at a Derrick Henry. He's still, I think, better than a lot of running backs in this league. And Baltimore may have found that missing piece with him. But he's not the same that he was three years right. ago. Right. And it's like he recognizes that. Nobody wants to admit that. But it kind of is what it is. So yeah. 615-737-1025. Uh, we will get to your phones on this kind of a state of the Titans where they are right now. But we both agree there is a plan. And it's good to see where that plan is. Chase and TD in today for Jared Stillman and Stillman and Company, broadcasting from the Spring Hill Heating and Cooling Game Nashville Studios, keeping your home feeling comfortable all year round. 1025, 1063, the game.
Chase and TD, 1025-1063, the game in for Stillman and company today on this Fireball Hot Take Friday. Discussing the Titans, kind of a state of the Titans, where we feel like they are at at this point in the process. We talked to Lloyd Cushenberry earlier in the show. Obviously, he's going to be a big piece on the offensive line, but we go to your phones, 615-737-1025. Now, I mentioned uh, Skyler's text that – Basically was saying, hey, I'm excited, but we're going to let it play out. Everything will be good. Steven says, I think you guys are underestimating the Titans offseason, especially if they draft Joe Alt. This could be a conference title contender. TD, your thoughts? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) look, I I think they could challenge for the – because. Whoa, 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 he said conference. He said no, conference. no, 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 no. He didn't say division. He division. Said I he he would have had me sure. a division, but conference. Hey, listen, listen, man. Optimism is great. I'm not that optimistic. I wouldn't be that optimistic if I was a Titans fan, you yeah. know. But it's great to have that that optimism. But I I don't see them. Where you understand the Ravens with Derrick Henry? It's not going to mm-hmm. be a fun game mm-hmm. to play Mm-mm. in December, January, et cetera. The Chiefs, they're they're not going away. I don't know about Buffalo. I don't think that mm. defense is going to be as strong. But you got the Chiefs, the Ravens. I mean, you could look at. Uh, I, I, I mean, <laughs> Rodgers with the Jets. I, I don't know what yeah, they are. You don't. Yeah, I. The Jets are just like I. I I, I, I know, but I have no idea. Right, right. But I think you, it's there's a lot. You know, even you look at the Bengals, right? Yep. With Joe Burrow healthy, like <laughs> they're still good. They're still you know good. what I mean? So I don't know that the Titans will challenge. And look, here's the other thing. They still got Higgins. They still got Chase. Tyler Boyd's unsigned. You know, maybe they circle back at some point on a on a cheap deal or they draft somebody. Yeah, and they I mean they got Andre Yushavis who they who they yeah. really like too, yeah. you know. So But I mean like looking at the Titans, we don't know that the schedule when the games are yet, but we know the opponents. Mm. They got to play the Bengals here. This is all here. Bengals, Packers. I, Packers should be in the mix for their division. Mm-hmm. Vikings will probably be down. Yeah. Patriots will probably be down. Got the Jet, Chargers, I believe, right? Uh, that's on the road. Yeah, on the road. Yeah. Uh, Jets. I have no idea what they are. And then Texans, Colts, Jags. Mm-hmm. You got to go to Buffalo. That's a that's a tough place to play, no matter what, no matter yeah. how good they are. Got to go to Chicago. Don't really know there. I mean, Chicago's done a lot to put Caleb Williams in a good position. Keenan Allen and uh-huh. DJ Moore. Uh-huh. Huh. Oh, Very good Cheeto, babe. Yep. A, a running mate. Yep. You got to go to Detroit. Yeah. That's a tough one. You got to yeah. go to L.A. to take on the Chargers. You're going back to Miami. Face Christian Fulton. In LA. Yep. Uh, Miami, yeah. Uh, got to go to Washington. I don't think they're going to be very good. Mm-hmm. And then Houston. Indy and Jacksonville. So while that is a, I guess, a last place schedule, it's still not an easy one. And so, you know, when you talk about conference and challenging for that, I, I don't know if I'm ready to go that far. Yeah. W- Wes and Hermitage has been waiting patiently on our phone line. Wes, what's up? Oh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Chase, you uh, you got the, the very first initial part of me being upset and quote-unquote overreacting. I'm sure you remember that, right? Uh, I mean, you never overreact, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so here's the deal, T, uh, TD. I, I like some of the things that they've done. I hate some of the things that they've done, but I also understand that, you know, you, you can't do all this in, uh, in one off season. But I just, I really need you to help me understand something. Okay. I remember two years ago, did we not go to Kansas City and try to play them without a quarterback, and it just didn't go well? <laughs> yeah. Right? I almost beat him. Almost beat him. We Chris Conley beat him dropped and, a pass. And we so didn't like, oh because yeah. we didn't have a quarterback, right? I, I think so that was Conley dropped the pass. It. You just yeah. said it. Okay. So, with that being said, last year, our Achilles heel was definitely our offensive line. So that's what we really need to do is, is work on this offseason is getting that offensive line built back up. However, why would we ever think that Jameis Winston would be a good option? Thankfully, I was so excited when the Browns, the dumbest franchise organization, whatever you want to call it in NFL, decides to go and sign them. 
And then we turn around and get Mason Rudolph and let Joe Flacco go to the Colts. What is going on? All right, Wes. I appreciate it. You know, that's a good point. No, he makes a good point. Let Joe Flacco go to the Colts. I I wanted Flacco. I know Jared wanted Flacco. And he was going to cost more than Mason Rudolph did. But I I wanted that veteran guy to go – that that knew he was going to come in and be a backup, and and be there to kind of mentor Will, uh, Will Evans. I don't know how much of a mentor Flacco would be, though. To be honest with you, okay. What do you I say don't that? know how comforting. And look, Levis, regardless, he's going to do what he does. But I mean, I don't think every veteran quarterback would be like Tannehill was last year, as far as helping out what's up, what's down. Pointers being there when he comes. I, I, so I don't you feel know. like that was happening with with Tannehill and Levis? After, oh yeah, it was happening. After I, Levis, I know took for a fact job. it was yeah. happening. Yeah, uh, from multiple parties: Charles London, Tannehill, yeah. Levis, Tim Kelly, and even just conversations with Levis. Yeah, it was happening. Um, okay, then they need to I, pick up the phone. <laughs> He's sitting out there doing nothing. I don't think he would come back. Like you saw how clear he was, know. He, you know what I mean? At in, in the presser, the Jaguars game. I kind of wonder. Just I don't. I don't know if he's done, done. But like, if he's content, just chilling, and then he's made almost two hundred million dollars. Right. Like just chilling with down in Miami and with the family. Fort Lauderdale. You see his, his vid- recent video yeah. where he was going, you know, spear fishing, yeah. grabbing the huge lobster, and all. He's living a life, man. I wouldn't blame him. Yeah, but I. I just. I don't know. How Flacco would be a, as a backup because I know that there were a little, a little bit of tension, you know, when Lamar took over back in. in sure, in but 19. that that was different. Like he he knew he still had something and was a starter, and now I think he well, he want comeback uh, player of the that, year. He he still has something. You, you know, but but I mean, do you think? And, and look, in Indy, he's in a better position that he could start games. We saw it last year. Right, Richardson because got hurt. Of the injury, risk. right? Yeah, and and like if I'm Indy, I'm a little concerned about that. But so you know, you pay a little more for a backup. But I, yeah. I see what you're saying. I mean, I, yeah. I get it. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You could have done much better than Mason Rudolph. That's yeah. not get it. Oh wrong. yeah, sure. But I think, and this goes back to a conversation I always have with Jared. You got it. It's the lens by which you look through. Yeah, you're not looking at him to be a guy to become the starter you're looking at him as a backup and in, as a backup he stepped in and and done a solid job yeah so right and and it, i mean the hope is mason you look good holding that clipboard buddy you never come in you know it's like you i used to always joke that jim sorgi had the greatest job in the world that he made like never three or four million a year, year and he was never going to sniff the field. He may have got a, was not coming up. Yeah, he got a few snaps in the preseason, and and then he just stood on the sideline with a ball cap and a clipboard the whole time. Yeah, no, that's it, man. That's and that's it. that's what you want. Coming up next, we're going to look at the remaining free agents in the position of need for the Titans and where what TD thinks uh, needs to be addressed and who could be a good fit. We will do that coming up next. It's Stillman and Company, Chase and TD. In for Jared today, 1025-1063 the game.
Brad, one of the things that you talked about when you first hired, before you hired Callie, after the Rabel fire, was that the vision. You didn't say what it was then. Can you talk about it now that you made the hire? Yeah, so our, our number one thing, again, is going to come back to getting the right people. I'm um, in the building, and like I'll forever say, you look at how we built this staff, it's going to be how we're going to build our football team with the right people. But, but there's an acronym I like to use, FIT, F-I-T, and where applicable, we want to be fast, instinctive, and tough. You know, if you look at a, a position like O-line, D-line, you don't necessarily have to be fast, so that F, you know, transitions to being fundamentally sound. And so we think those are the three things that you're going to need to, to build a good football team moving forward, you know, either being fast, instinctive, and tough, or fundamentally sound, instinctive, and tough. It was Rand Carthon talking about what he's looking for in players, Chase and TD. Here in for Jared Stillman today, 1025-1063, the game. So as we talk about the Titans, the state of the Titans, where they're at right now, obviously we know, TD, that there are still some holes left to be filled on this football team. When it comes to free agents, you know, you're at that point of kind of a wait-and-see mode. But mm -hmm. first, if you had to rank – the top three positions of need for the Titans as of today, I mean, we know one of them for sure, but how would you rank them? I was shaking my head because I wasn't sure which one to put first, but I would say tackle. I would right. go tackle, cornerback, inside linebacker, defensive tackle. Yeah, I, I have no pushback then there. Then safety. Yeah, and I feel like – I feel like safety, they're going to – one of these guys, like, they're finally going to realize that, hey, the money you want isn't there and probably bring in like a – like, do you think Justin Simmons could still be in play potentially? Uh, potentially, yeah. I mean, Marcus May, I wonder what happened there. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm really curious why – well, we'll get into that. But to your point, the safety position, look, Elijah Molden is still on the roster. Yeah. Right? And so is Imani Hooker. But here's the problem. Both of those guys have struggled to play a full season. So now it's like your first two options are not as rock solid as maybe your first option at D-tackle or D-line, right, with Jeffrey Simmons. Yeah. So that's the tough – well, I mean, Simmons has had his share of injuries too, but you get what I'm saying. Sure. Yeah, so I would agree with you on that. So when you look at free agents that are out there, it you know, obviously we're at that point where, like we were saying with DBs, that – you know, guy may have thought, hey, I'm going to be worth a certain price. Like, we just saw Christian Fulton sign a one-year deal mm -hmm. with the Chargers, and he was probably out there looking for the big contract. He's going to have to go play on a prove-it deal. What is, who are some guys that are out there that you think still might be a fit for the Titans as some of these prices come down? Yeah. Um, off the bat, Julian Blackman, he comes to, he comes to mind. Yeah. Look, he, he had a, a injury in 2022. He didn't play. He bounced back last year. It was three or four interceptions he got. I love the way he plays against the run. He was one of those safeties. Like, remember when Ryan Clark was saying, hey, look, man, like, DBs don't want any of Derrick Henry. He was one of those. Yeah. He really did. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? He would like come up. After he, it. Yeah. So I thought that was good. I, I think, you know, him being available, he's somebody. Uh, you look at the inside linebacker position, I would just leave it alone. Mm -hmm. I. There's nobody that I think they should look at. And that's why that's such a big need because it's like o Otis Reese the fourth, you know, very athletic. I, I don't know that he would be the guy that I would have wearing the green dot. Jack Gibbons, I could see him wearing the, the, the green dot, but you're losing a degree of athleticism. You are getting some discipline. And, I mean, he look, he had that one play where he ran with the receiver, you know, down the middle of the field and covered him pretty well. But – I think you got to find somebody to pair with Kenneth Murray so you could just let him just unleash and attack. Yeah, I'm worried about inside linebacker. Yeah, so you got that. Uh, I tell you, I like Akella Weatherspoon. And he's out of – he with the Rams, he had a pretty solid season with the Rams last year. Three uh, interceptions, pretty good in coverage. He's a longer guy, like 6'2". He was a teammate at Colorado with, with Awuzie, too. So I think, you know, you bring him in, he's what, I think 28, I want to say. So he's a younger, you know, still yeah. younger player. It's not going to be an expensive deal. Like two years, 20-something million is, is the projected one. So you got that. Um, Andrews Pete is another interesting one to me because – And then they bring him in. He visited, yeah, yeah. this past – this this week. And he's interesting because of how he finished the year with the Saints as their left tackle, you, you know. And I thought, hey, you sign him, that gives you an option 
as one of the guard spots if you want, or a swing guy, or he could be, you know, a left tackle if you don't get Joe Alt. You know what I mean? Right. And you're not comfortable with what you get at 38. So I, I think those are those are the three: Julian Blackman, Akella Weatherspoon, and Andrews Pete. And and it probably, I mean, they still. You know, have what forty five million in cap space? Or, yeah, they or have something space. Like that. They I have mean, they, they have money to to burn. They you know, even with the you know, and I was reading some of uh, you know, uh, football and other F words pod kind of breaking down you know some of the things about the Snead deal that you know the report is it was close to being done with the Titans, but it was the contract that was the hold up, not the draft picks. The deal fell through. That's when the Titans ended up signing Ridley, but they still would have if they're able to get. You know, Snead at a at a decent price, they could probably yeah. pull it off. Yeah, and not the draft picks. Again, it's a fl- it's a fluent situation. Initially, it was the draft picks. Yeah, right. They backed off of it. Other teams backed off too, and so the Chiefs circled back. Hey, big head. You know what I mean? Yeah. And to see what you know what would happen with the Titans. That that's that's my understanding of how it works. Do you do you buy when the chief like the report comes out and the Chiefs say like, hey, we're fine keeping him and him playing on the tag. Do you buy that, that that is the case, or do they know that, hey, we're not going to sign – we can't sign him long term. Let's just let's just get what we can right now and go ahead and move on. I think both things could be true. Okay. I think they're looking at it like, okay, they're not going to sign him. You got Nick Bolton. You, you got, yeah, I mean, they can't – You know, yeah. their center that they have to extend to. So, you know, I don't think that they have a long-term future with him regardless. And they're like, okay, well, we're looking to get a second round pick, mm-hmm. you know, a third round pick, whatever. And now it's like, okay, if, if if we could get a solid pick, cool. If not, you know, he'll play, be good for them, and they let him walk. And then they you got to figure out, you know, the comp pick schedule, like how that'll work. But they'll they'll get some type of compensation anyway. You know, I when I see situations like this, I always think like, try and imagine a world in the NFL without the franchise tag. Because I mean, if you think about it, they're the only. I mean, I know you have restricted free agents, which you have that in the NFL too, but like they're the only league that has anything like that. Yeah, you know, and only I don't with, like it. I, I, don't I like it I've all. never liked it. I don't like it at all. And I know. It depends on who you ask, player wise. Like, you know, if you're a if you're a wide receiver and you're getting the top f- the average of the top five money, like you probably don't hate it, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. But but like, there's some guys that okay, you know, especially like you think about a, a a defensive lineman that can also play can play inside and outside. Brian Burns, that's was a, a good that's example. a big difference. Yeah, you know, like yeah. well, am I a linebacker or am I a Am I a down lineman? You know, mm-hmm. it's a different. Am I a corner or am I a safety? Mm-hmm. You know, like if I'm a nickel mm-hmm. guy or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like so, there's a big difference there. I just, I don't know. If, I, I don't know if I see it sticking around forever. Like I could see the players and the you know eventually, at least modifying it. But yeah. it, but it would change the game when it comes to free agency. If think about how many guys. Are gonna be would be out there and available because you don't have the tag. Like T. Higgins would be a free. T. Agent. Higgins would have set the the reset the market. Oh, hundred percent. Right? Jerry Sneed would have gotten that twenty two. So if I'm sure a team would do that and not if they didn't have to give up the compensation, yeah. I would think a team would do. It, you know, so, if I'm Jamar yeah. Chase, I'm sitting there going like, I wish T. Higgins wasn't on this <laughs> franchise tag. <laughs> Because he goes out there and he resets the market, and then what does Jamar Chase turn around and do? Yeah. Resets it again. Well, that's why you want CeeDee Lamb to go ahead and sign first. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. You know, and, and Chase is getting more than him. He is. He's going to get more than him, but you want CeeDee Lamb to sign Kinda to reset the, the market and be like, hey, look, man. Who's that's the my highest floor. paid receiver right now? I want to say Tyreek Hill. You mean, I yeah. want to say that feels right. I I, I don't know honestly because it, it's just been shifting so much. I would say I I think average per year. I think Devonte Adams, uh, but I'm not sure. Now what's interesting? I think there's somebody sitting out there that you and I both know that are familiar with. Uh, that might be sitting there watching how this market's going to reset because you know. He's probably going to want a new, another new contract soon. That's A.J. Brown. <laughs> He's a, it was a three-year deal, right? Or was it a five-year deal? Uh, I think it was a four. Or a four. So, I think it was a four. I mean, look, he's going to be going into year three. 
of that deal. So and AJ is the fourth highest receiver, highest paid receiver. Yeah, Tyreek average per year. Tyreek Hill at thirty, Devontae Adams at twenty eight, Cooper Cup at twenty six point seven, AJ at twenty four. So Ridley would right be in there in the top ten. He would yeah. be right around uh, Debo Samuel, I believe. Debo Samuel, Terry, right, right in between. He would be eighth because he's just slightly more than Terry McLaurin. Yeah. Oh wow. And look, you know, we didn't. I meant to bring this up earlier. We're talking about free agency. Did they maybe, maybe overpay a little bit for Calvin Ridley? Probably. But you know what? I'm okay with it. That's the price of doing business. Mm-hmm. And some of these deals, like the fact that the Titans are getting connected to so many different things, and like this guy's coming to visit, or they're in on Snead, or whether they come to fruition or not. Like, everybody that wanted to sit out there, you know, and, and look, I'll direct this at Jared, too, of, hey, what what are they doing? You know, Rand doesn't know what he's doing. They're out there trying. They're, they're in the mix. He's they're in Gardner the mix. Johnson, DJ yeah. Reader. You know, we're sitting there talking about, hey, D-line's a need. Safety's a need. You know, the, had, the player has to agree to come here. Bingo. Like, <laughs> and they had some irons in the fire on both of those guys. Yeah. So, you know. so look, 615-737-1025. We will get to your calls, to your texts. Coming up next, he's Teron Davenport, Chase McCabe in today for Jared Stillman. Score big this spring with Lee Company and the Nashville Predators in the $10,000 Power Play giveaway. Enter for a chance to win a Kohler Home Generator or $10,000 or $10, towards Lee Company's home services. That's right, a Kohler Home Generator or $10,000 towards Lee Company home services. Go online to leecompany.com slash giveaway to enter. That's leecompany.com slash giveaway in the $10,000 Power Play giveaway. Contest and entries are accepted until Saturday, April 20th. Lee Company, all you need.
Chase and TD in today for Stillman and Company. We'll talk to Chad Withrow coming up in just a few minutes from OutKick. Getting to your phone, 615-737-1025. That's our phone and text line driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. Two days in a row you get to ask TD some questions, so get them in there it. if you have some. Uh, you'll have fun with this question. Uh-oh. Simple question. A.J. Brown or Calvin Ridley, which is a better receiver? Come on, man. I mean, look, there's, there's not a question in my mind. It's A.J. There aren't many receivers in the league better than A.J. Yeah. I'll put him up against just about anybody. Just you talk about complete player. Right. Now, you tell me if I'm off base or, or if I'm on the right track here. I think the reason I like Xavier Leggett so much is because I kind of see the I see the comp mm-hmm. a little bit. Like, mm-hmm. the build – the body movement, the the speed. Now he, he's a little faster than AJ. Yeah, he's four three nine. AJ yeah. is four five. But you don't see AJ get caught from behind. No, too much. no. But I mean, I see a guy that like as soon as the ball hit AJ's hands, he became a running back. Yeah, yeah. It's and the that that's the catch yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's I think one reason. And those guys don't grow on trees. I will say this, and I don't know if the texture was alluding to this. Get get all, like I'm tired of the will. Why'd they pay Ridley this and they just couldn't pay two like, different regimes, two different regimes, and two situations, di- right? So much. I'm just over it. Like who I'm else just, are they gonna pay? Like, sure, you know what right. I mean. They they signed two guys. They signed a center to the record breaking deal for guaranteed money for yeah. a center. Right, right. They signed Calvin Ridley, made him the number eight highest paid receiver. Right. They still got fifty four million dollars to spend. Right. Right, and and but my the thing that cracks me up, and I'm sure it does you too. It's like we need a receiver, we need a receiver, we need to spend money on a receiver, we need to f- sign a receiver, got to sign a receiver. They sign a receiver. Well, why didn't they pay AJ? Why didn't they pay AJ that? Like, I mean, it's just like you, that was three years ago. Get over it. Yeah, Don't move deal. on. Move on. It, by the way, real quick, AJ has the AJ Brown Foundation actually launched this week too. So oh, nice! Shout out to AJ. Good, for good for that. Uh, another texter says, saw a report on Twitter that the Titans thought they were signing Cam Curl, but he ended up signing with the Rams. Any mm-hmm. details on that? Is that mm-hmm. true? Yeah, uh, Adam Kaplan, had, had he talked about that. Uh, they did think that he was going to be uh, – it was reported that he was – that was the young safety yeah. that they were going to do. Okay. Well, uh, I asked you this during the break, but um, what about Isaiah Simmons at linebacker? No. I, and even if they do sign, it, it'll be a low cost signing. But I, I don't think that he answers anything. I think essentially, uh, it's not really of a difference from Otis Reese, right? Where you got a young athletic. Now he's a better athlete, athlete, you know, and and more physically imposing. But it's just he could. There's nothing that he does that is just like, okay, right. you put him at this position. You put him at that position. And it didn't work in Arizona. It didn't work with the Giants. Like, it just, no, that's not one that they would be the answer. Uh, Taylor says, defense has holes everywhere. I don't expect this team to be a contender, a true contender for another two years. Mm-hmm. And that's if Levis pans out. Yeah, and I, mean, I think that's, that's what this year. And, and see, that's the whole thing that is lost on everyone when they say, hey, look, this has to be like the, the Texans. You know, their off season has to be like the Texans. No, it, it doesn't. The Texans are a step ahead in that they know that they got that guy. Yeah. The Titans seem to believe they have that guy, so they surrounded him. I think the Titans are in the situation that the Texans were last year where it's like, okay, we think we got our guy. Let's surround him with talent and see if he proves what we believe to be true to be true. Yeah, and another thing too, when we had uh, Joe and I had Rand Carthon on, you know, a few weeks ago. Yeah, um, uh, talking about the combine when he was at the combine, you know, and I asked him, I'm like, look, you think you got your guy, but how much do you put into the research and you know looking at these quarterbacks? And I and I was really impressed with his answer of like, if I'm not doing that, I'm not doing my job. You know, like you every year, and and I remember Floyd said one time that as a GM, if if you could get away with it, you draft a quarterback every year because it's the most important position. Like, I'm not saying they're going to, you know, because they got three on the roster right now. But mm-hmm. if the board tells them in the sixth round, and they got what three seventh round picks this year, that hey, there's a quarterback sitting there we really really like, mm-hmm. and they take him, Joe okay, Milton and stuff. yeah, Joe. Like yeah. if they took Joe Milton in the sixth or the seventh round. 
I know the Vols fans be like, yeah, go, go Big Orange. But, right. like, I wouldn't hate that. I don't yeah. expect him to do yeah. anything, but it's like, okay, see what he's got. To your point, the Packers had Brett Favre. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And they drafted Aaron Rodgers. Sure. Because it was a guy, look, they had Aaron Rodgers and drafted Jordan Love. Jordan Love. Right. You know what I mean? Because these are guys that, that fell to them. Well, in Love's case, they had to trade up to get sure. him. But, you know, still. You have to – you have to keep looking at that position. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you think the 49ers had planned on Brock Purdy being their guy when they took him as Mr. Irrelevant? Absolutely. Not. But guess what? It worked out. It worked out. And, and they got their it, dude that's it, making, you know, probably less than you and me right now. <laughs> <laughs> and you know the other thing, too, with that is, and Mike Vrabel used to allude to this a lot, where they would refer back to this period when they were doing the scouting and evaluation at times, you know, when they were going against the team, you know, yeah. or when that, that guy became available right. more Vrabel, we refer to that. Like, Oh yeah, we did some work on him back when, you know what I mean? And that helped lead them into knowing that he was the guy that they wanted to sign in free agency. Right. Six one five seven three seven one two five. You can keep the text coming, but coming up next, Chad Withrow from Outkick going to join us here on the show. And, Hmm. There's a bat. One basketball team won. Another one lost. I wonder what he's going to have to say about that. We will discuss this with Chad and much more in the fourth hour of Stillman and Company chasing TD in today. One or two five. One or six three. The game.
Chase and TD in today for Stillman and Company. 1025-1063, the game. On this Fireball Hot Take Friday, you can weigh in on anything that we're talking about. 615-737-1025. That's our phone and text line. Driven by WilsonCountyHyundai.com. We're going to be joined by Chad Withrow from OutKick here in just a few minutes. Uh, as I'm sure he will have some things to say about the Vols winning and Kentucky losing. Got some tight ones right now in day number two. Yale University will not go away as they currently lead Auburn 44-43. That one about 15-39 to go in the second half. Uh, this one just in the around the same amount of time, 15 and a half minutes to go. Second half, Colorado leads Florida 57-56. So some tight games involving SEC teams right now. As you heard in the update, Marquette defeated Western Kentucky 87-69. Uh, earlier today so the hilltoppers fall in that one and more games coming up a little later tonight texas a&m and nebraska will uh, tip off at the end of this hour um, that one uh, taking place down in memphis at the fedex forum duke and vermont uh, at 6 10 then you got purdue number one seed in grambling state as grambling state got their first tournament win the other night alabama and charleston at 6 35 houston at 820 against Longwood, that also in Memphis uh, being uh, TD's pick. And then uh, James Madison and Wisconsin, a late game as well. And then TCU, Utah State, Grand Canyon with Bryce Drew in St. Mary's. We say hello to Chad Withrow from Outkick who joins us now. Chad, I don't know what we're going to talk about. How you feeling? How you doing? Doing well through one round. But, you know, as a Tennessee basketball fan, I could, I could say that a lot of years uh, after one round of the tournament. So uh, we'll we'll see how the rest of the weekend plays out. But I will say this, Chase, I'm doing a lot better than Kentucky fans today. That's for sure. Oh yeah, we're going to get to that in a second. But it, we'll we'll talk about your Vols first. I feel like that the way that game played out is exactly how it needed to play out to not necessarily shut some people up, but to to calm people down. Now they they got to go and do it again against Texas, which they're I think a six point favorite against. But I thought that the way they played against St. Peter's is exactly how they needed to play. Yeah, I would agree. They were really good, and that's how you know a number one or number two seed should come out and look. We saw it with UConn today, too, where they just came out and easily handled business from the very start, and Tennessee did that last night. I was impressed. I thought it was important for Santiago Vescovi to hit a couple threes because both him and Josiah Jordan-James are so lost on offense right now, and James didn't score last night, only took two shots and still looks lost, but I thought it was big for Vescovy to hit a couple of shots, so everything was good. You know, Dalton Connect looked good. Uh, I thought uh, um, Ziegler was really good. Adu, much better than that SEC tournament against Tolu Smith at Mississippi State. So check, check, check with everything in round one. I will say, and I'm not trying to be, you know, Debbie Downer on anything, but that performance was so easy and so well done by Tennessee. It reminded me of two years ago where they stomped Longwood in the first game, and they went out in round two and lost to an underachieving Michigan team that had a ton of talent. Well, now Tennessee stomps their first-round opponent two years later, and in round two they're going to get an underachieving Texas team with a ton of talent. So I do think there's some similarities between Michigan and Texas. I'll also say I don't think there's a bunch of similarities between that Tennessee team and this one, namely because this Tennessee team has Dalton Connect, who is a consensus first-team All-American. I know you like talk and Vols, and I get it, but I, I would imagine the only thing that, that you can compare to you talk and Vols and the excitement is the excitement of a Kentucky loss. So I got to ask you, you look at this loss to Oakland, does that think, do you think that signals the end of the road for, for Calipari? Fire Cal! TD, I think that it should. Uh, I think it certainly it's it's launched a lot of debates about the merits of John Calipari and the merits of a lifetime contract, nine million dollars a year, and most importantly, a thirty-three million dollar buyout. How angry are you if you are a Kentucky <laughs> booster and you're a millionaire, and Mitch Barnhart comes to you and says, "Hey, uh, really need to you know correct that mistake and move on. Will you give me ten million dollars to help make that happen, and I'll go to two or three other guys?" and make sure we can get that buyout money. Because it is Mitch Barnhart who signed this contract into existence. And maybe these Kentucky boosters are so angry 
they're going to Mitch Barnhart and saying, I'll pledge 3 or $4 million if you can get it from everyone else to help buy out John Calipari. But I think his biggest issue is, and we saw in the post-game interview last night, this unwillingness to yeah. accept responsibility yep. and, and this lack of flexibility also. Right, He's a guy who wants to do it his way, and that's bringing in freshmen and bringing in one-and-done players, and he hasn't really adapted to the college game over the last seven to ten years where we've seen teams that are older having more and more success. Mm-hmm. And even last night, he's already hyped up his freshman class coming in, which is very talented and will feature multiple NBA players again, and saying, well, we probably should bring in an older player in the transfer portal, but maybe not. Maybe we'll be good enough. And I hear that, and I think, yeah, he still just really hasn't figured it out that he's got to adjust and change. And if he's not going to do it now, he's never going to do it. And if that's the case, I think you've got to think long and hard about it if you're Mitch Barnhart. Yeah, and, and I mean, look, to me, Texas A&M proved, and I know they got different kind of money, but if things aren't working out, you can buy out a coach. So I, I, I don't view the whole $33 million buyout, which that's their fault to begin with, as you mentioned, is a reason not to do it. You can put it together – because right now you have the most overrated coach in college basketball and you're the most overrated program in college basketball because you haven't been to the Final Four in nine years. And obviously we know that they don't have the championship to show for it either. Yeah, I saw something on social media last night. In the 2020s decade, Fairleigh Dickinson has two NCAA tournament wins, Oral Roberts has two, and Kentucky has one. So that pretty much sums up Kentucky these last five years. They didn't make it in 2021. They made it in 2022 and lost to St. Peter's in the first round. They won a game last year, then lost to K-State in the second round. Then they get bounced by Oakland in the first round this year. And Chase, the perfect example of what you're talking about with buyout money and coming up with it if you really want to do it and you're that motivated, is right down the road at Vanderbilt. Jeff Goodman's yeah. reporting that Jerry Stackhouse was $25 million Ooh. for the buyout. I've heard anything from 13 to $18 million, but that Jeff Goodman report was the first time I've ever heard $25 million. So with Vandy, that let's face it, we don't really know how much they care about sports or basketball given recent years, but if they can come up with $25 million, first off, that makes me believe, A, they do really care about basketball, and B, Kentucky can certainly come up with $33 million if Andy can pay Jerry Stackhouse $25 million to walk away. So I, I definitely wanted to bring this up with you because Joe and I got this text this morning on our show of, you know, basically you're sitting there saying that Kentucky has won three championships in 30 years and all of that in basketball. The Vols have only won one championship in 50 years in football or whatever it's been, you know, in 98. So what like are are you saying that they're overrated too? I think the expectations are completely different for Kentucky oh, basketball absolutely. and Tennessee football. Yeah. But Kentucky's the gold standard uh, of basketball. I mean, that's just ask a Kentucky fan. And, and they should be. Like I I'm not sitting here saying they're being ridiculous for being mad at John Calipari. I, I'd be furious with them too if I were a Kentucky fan. They've been to more NCAA tournaments than anyone. Tennessee is a top ten or fifteen all time football program. They're not one, two, three, four, or five, right? And even if you are a Kentucky hater, they're in the top three or four all-time basketball programs, right? So, yeah, I think the the expectations are very different. The landscape is very different in both sports. Uh, and look, t- Tennessee's got a very good historical football program. They're not Kentucky basketball good, and I think uh, even Tennessee fans would have to acknowledge that uh, that Kentucky basketball is in a different, you know, they're in a completely different league than Tennessee football with the expectations. But those expectations continue to slip. And Kentucky fans, Chase, have been very patient with John Calipari. More patient than they are with most coaches. I saw that patience end last night. Just go online, go to a Kentucky message board, listen to Kentucky Sports Radio post game. You can see that their patience officially ended with that loss to Oakland last night. <laughs> Look, you talked about how – college basketball is different right because you have these these groups of, of players they stick together more so as a result you know you got a saint mary's that got a, a number five ranking in their bracket you got Creighton a number three who are some underdog teams that that you look here who, who are some cinderella teams and you know, obviously oakland is one but who are some that you would think of well, one is Grand Canyon yes. uh, with former Vanderbilt coach Bryce Drew, who's playing later tonight. I, I really like them. Uh, you mentioned St. Mary's, TD. I, I like that St. Mary's 
program, but I really like Grand Canyon. I've, I've watched a couple of their games this year. Uh, they play an up-tempo style, and they got some, they got some players. So I like them as a possible 12-5 upset. The other one that everyone is talking about is James Madison. Mm. We saw them beat Michigan State and Tom Izzo on opening night of the college season, and I think they ended up 34-3 and on the year. I think they lost three games all season. Um, they play uh, the 12-5 game against Wisconsin, and then if they win, they play Duke, likely. I like James Madison getting to the Sweet 16. Ooh. Now, I say this as someone whose bracket is just okay right now. It's not completely busted. Um, but uh, I had Drake in the Sweet 16 also. So that's yeah. another uh, you know, 10 seed that I liked advancing, and they blew it last night. But James Madison and Grand Canyon are two that I would watch tonight and watch closely. Hmm. Uh, our, our buddy Ricky has said he, he, he'll pass on that one. He thinks they're too much of a public dog. Who's, who's too much of a public James dog? Madison. Grand James Madison. Oh, James Madison. See, this is what I started to worry about, uh, and Ricky knows this also. This is what I started to worry about with Samford. Because I was in on Samford quickly because yeah. I knew Kansas had all the injury issues. And then when Kevin McCuller was ruled out, everyone jumped on Samford, mm. whether it be just picking them to upset or betting on them. And I immediately hated the pick once that happened. I'm not going with UConn to the Final Four because everybody has UConn going to the Final Four. And I think since 2016, we have not seen a team that's the defending national champion get out of the first weekend oh. in the tournament. The last time it happened was Duke. Duke won it all in 2015 and then got to the Sweet 16 in 2016. Since then, the defending national champion has been bounced in the first or second round of the tournament. I, I've got UConn getting to the second weekend but I think I had them losing to Auburn in the Sweet 16. So um, I'm waiting for some craziness to happen. But so far, really, the wackiest thing we've seen was Oakland beating Kentucky last night. Uh, you're busking, busting my bracket, man, talking about UConn, you know what I mean? But I want to ask you about Houston. Uh, what are your thoughts on Houston? I have them winning it all. How do you think that looks? Yeah, Shad is awesome for Houston. Um, Kelvin Sampson plays a style that I think is conducive to success in the NCAA tournament. The knock on him is kind of the same knock on Rick Barnes, that you know what you're going to get defensively from a Kelvin Sampson team, yeah, but not sure. always offensively. Uh, and that's kind of been the knock on Rick Barnes. This team is good on offense. I mean, look, there, there were three teams all year in UConn, Purdue, and Houston that were uh, quite a bit ahead of everyone else, right? They were three clear-cut number one seeds, really going back to early February, and they never wavered. So... I put Houston in that group with UConn and Purdue. And then right outside of that, you've got North Carolina, Arizona, Tennessee, Iowa State, um, Marquette. You know, you could put the three seeds in that group also. But they're kind of all bunched together. There's probably four or five teams in that group that you could say they could win it all, but they're in that group behind Purdue, UConn, and Houston. And I, I've got a ton of respect for Houston. Um, I, I don't look too much into them getting blown out in the Big 12 championship by Iowa State. Yeah. I know a lot of people overvalue those conference tournament outcomes. I really don't. I think Tennessee and Mississippi State, quite frankly, show you a little bit of that, the way both teams played on the opposite ends in the NCAA tournament after Mississippi State looked like a national championship contender when they played Tennessee last week in, in Nashville. So I really like Houston. Um, I think I've got them in the Elite Eight. But uh, we get our, our first chance to see him in the tournament coming up tonight. Hey, one more for you, um, because I can't really figure this one out. It, it tips off here in just a little bit, too. A&M and Nebraska tonight. I, I want to lean A&M, that I, and I like you know what they've, what they've done, but what do you think about this one? I keep going back and forth on it. I think I picked A&M in my bracket. I know Nebraska is like a one-point favorite, maybe one and a half. Yep. Um, Tominaga for Nebraska is a wild man. Uh, watch that guy play. He will either shoot Nebraska into a 20-point win or, I mean, go one for 14 from the floor and not stop shooting. He, he is a, a just fascinating to watch play the game of basketball. He's difficult to even understand how he's good when you watch him play at times, but he can get it done. He's a flamethrower when he heats up. So uh, that, that's an exciting player to watch for Nebraska. This, this is very rare for the Huskers. I think it was 10 years ago is the last time they were in the tournament, even with Tim Miles as their head coach. This one tournament appearance got Fred Hoiberg a contract extension with the Huskers, so this is a big year for them. 
But uh, I, I like the guard play. Um, I love Boots Radford. I love Wade Taylor the fourth for, for Texas A and M. So I'm going to give them a slight advantage to, to get them over the hump against Nebraska. Well, Chad, going to be fun. Uh, we'll see what the Vols can do tomorrow. Appreciate it as always, and uh, talk to you soon. All right, appreciate it, Chase. Thank you, guys. Have a good one, uh, Chad. With her joining us from Outkick, talking some hoops with him. We'll give you a, a scoring update. In just a few minutes, here on Stillman & Company, Chase and TD in for Jared today. 1025-1063, the game.
Chase and TD in today for Stillman and Company. Got some tournament games going on. Auburn leads Yale 61-55. But I tell you what, Yale will not go away. They are not. It just when you think Auburn's pulling away, Yale comes fighting back. Uh, so that's the one we're watching. Florida trails Colorado 75-69. Again, Florida not quite going away, but it's been it was tied at 45 at the half. And uh, Colorado has had a slight edge uh, there in Indianapolis in the second half, uh, waiting on some other games uh, to get underway. Just those two going on right now. What's about to tip off at the end of this hour will be Texas A&M and Nebraska down at the FedEx Forum in Memphis, and then Duke in Vermont in the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York. Full schedule of games later on. Uh, tonight so um, definitely we'll be paying attention to that congratulations to the mtsu blue raiders women's team as they knocked off louisville they will advance to the next round right now 94.9 the fan baylor is up on vanderbilt 14-4 in the ncaa women's basketball tournament uh, is that one 450 to go in the first quarter so keep you updated on all of that but you know td you and i um don't get to do this much it's almost baseball season. <laughs> baseball is about to start, and I just saw Bob Nightingale, longtime baseball writer, putting out Major League Baseball has opened an investigation into Shohei mm-hmm. Otani. Mm-hmm. His uh, interpreter was let go because of gambling, and now there's stuff potentially connecting Shohei. This could get ugly. It's interesting the way that kind of went up and down. Uh, definitely have to shout out ESPN's Letitia Thompson for the mm-hmm. reporting that she did. I mean, she was able to get the interpreter on the phone twice yeah, and give her two different stories. And initially the belief was that Shohei was funneling that money to cover yeah. his interpreter's gambling habits and, and things like that, uh, his problem. And then it turns out that, wait a minute, no, that wasn't the case. And Otani didn't. Now, this is just based off their reporting. Otani didn't fully understand or realize what was going on until they had a meeting. And then they had a meeting, and in that meeting, he got the revelation that that was was what was happening. And that's when he charged him with the the theft. And so now everything is just, (laughs) oh. Look, I I hope it's – I hope it's something as simple as that because Shohei Otani is good for baseball. Yeah, the fact that you have a guy that is a you know elite pitcher and an elite hitter, which we haven't seen in a very very long time. Yep. Um, it's got the the butts and seats factor for sure, and obviously you know he, I know he's moved LA teams, but you know staying in Los Angeles, it, it's good for the game to have a player like that. Absolutely, but like. The first thing I thought of when I, you know, when I heard about this was, man, like this is all the rumors you heard about Jordan back in the day, and like, is that why he went and played baseball for a couple of years? Because yeah. it was like, the the old rumor was that Stern had been like, look, go play baseball, you know, yeah. let this blow let it over, cool, over, you know, yeah, let it cool. There were rumors that that led into his his dad's death, right? Too, right. There was a cool. lot of stuff yeah. surrounding all of that, but. I just, I ah, man, like, I don't know. Like, I don't know if you can really play this off as, oh, I, I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on. $4 million is an awful lot to, to not to know. To not know what's going on. You know what I mean? You know? And I understand, like, he signed for, what, half a million or whatever. What, yeah. 400? Four million is a lot to Yeah. Like, so you really know what's going on with it. I just, I have a feeling this is going to take some twists and turns. Before it gets, it could definitely take some. Before it gets, it gets could get there. ugly. Oh yeah, it, it could. Ugly. Like, and you know that baseball's sitting there going, just like really, yeah. Like we got these rules figured out. And people are watching our games and liking our games and coming to it's our games, just not, right? And like, it, it's just you know we're finally back and feeling good. And one of our biggest, most popular players now is under investigation. Yeah, it's, and it's like it's you got to be kidding me. Yeah. It's just once you get there, but. That didn't change it for us. Like, I'm excited, obviously, me being a Braves fan, you being a Mets fan, the NL East. Yeah. Once again, I mean, uh, we up know for grabs. It is. It's not up for grabs, man. The Braves are going. Well, it'll be interesting. Braves and Phillies, but, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm excited 
to get it started again. Yeah. Cause, no, no doubt. You know, the, the Braves have – I think what they've done with, with their roster, you know, obviously they, they needed to work on pitching. That was what got them last year. They had the best lineup in the majors – uh, in a very very long time, but the pitching got away from them, and it ultimately led to, to their defeat. Mm-hmm. You know, down the stretch and, and in the playoffs, I think they've addressed that. You know, with with some of the moves that they've made. But how do you feel about your Mets? <laughs> I love these Mets. You know, listen, listen um, my guy, my favorite, well, one of my two favorite players in the league, Edwin Diaz, turned thirty today. You know. Well, happy birthday! I wanted to queue up the narcos, you know, the trumpets. Oh. I cannot wait. April fourteenth, we're going to see Doc's jersey retirement. June first is going to be strawberries, but I can't wait to be in. I, I just would love to experience that narco, like him coming. Yeah. I love it. But do they still have the guy that comes out and plays it on the trumpet? Uh, they play it over there. Yeah. Uh, Tommy something, Tommy trumpet. Yeah, they had him Timmy there. Trump. Timmy yeah. trumpet. They had him there a couple times, but that was just like a novelty dun, thing. Dun, dun, yeah, dun, yeah dun, dun, that's that's dun, dun, so. Dun, dun, yeah, it's dun, it's dun, 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 yeah, and then just the way he comes running out, just right to it, back to back outings. The last couple of days, his first one, he struck out the side. Yeah. So, look, I'm excited about that because that's something to be, you know, you have a guy to close the games out. I will say this, the um, uh, J.D. Martinez signing is, is, is very interesting because obviously he was an all-star last year, outstanding D.H., but it's a little different when you look at him as the D.H. because he never plays anything else, yeah. right? Whereas some teams, like, they use the D.H. to funnel – Hey, let's let's get Alonzo a day off and let him DH. You know what I mean? But I wonder just with the baby Mets, right? Mark Vientos, one of my favorite baby Mets players. He was supposed to be the DH, and now you know, obviously, that's not going to happen. Yeah, I don't think you know pitching is going to be the hurdle. Uh, they have a pretty solid lineup, but pitching yeah, that's going to be the problem, and they yes. they just don't have it. You know, they well, you had to trade it. off. I mean, you know, they traded off some pretty good pitchers last year. When yeah. They were, Kind and they got selling. some good prospects. They got yeah, they no, got Acuna's was, little brother, yeah. you know, who's who's oh, going to be good eventually. You know, I I mean I you know it's always hard to tell, but I mean I know some of the early looks at him as he might be better than his brother. And his brother's pretty darn good. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, yeah. reigning and defending most valuable player. Yeah, he's something special. He he, sounds, he is, but I will tell you, it and it, it might have been like like you know off the field and stuff. He he's fine, but it's just. There are sometimes like some of the decisions he makes, like when he does when when he doesn't run through a play at first, like in and Snit used to pull him out, you know, and mm-hmm. still does from time mm-hmm. to time. And it's mm-hmm. just like, dude, hustle every play. Yeah, every like play. that stuff drives me nuts. Yep. With that. And it's just, you know, kind of some of his attitude. But he's a heck of a player. Yeah. I mean, there's no denying it that he is um he's the reigning MVP and I wouldn't be surprised if he's in the mix again oh absolutely this year so yeah. um well that's cool you're gonna get to see docs yeah, I can't jersey wait. Retire. I can't wait. it's it's crazy so you know the early part of my life the first 12 years of my life i lived in new york okay that's why i'm a mets fan from philly you yeah, know yeah, what yeah i mean but uh never got to see him pitch never yeah i always like my aunt would take me to games and it was always ron darling mm-hmm. bob ojita sid fernandez like I never got to see Doc pitch. Yeah, and we talked earlier about the playoff atmosphere and how exciting it was. Man, when Doc pitched, they said that Shea Stadium was different. Yeah, you know what I mean. You could feel it watching the game, but being there. So I can't wait to experience just a little bit of that. You know what yeah. I mean when his jerseys retired. Yeah. Um. So I got to when I was in eighth grade, we did our New York or did our school trip to New York, and we saw it was mid April. Saw the Mets and the Cardinals at really? Shea Stadium. Really? Mike Piazza. I got to see Piazza. Mike Piazza. So I can say – and McGuire. McGuire was playing for the Cardinals. So mm-hmm. I got – I can say that I got to see Mike Piazza and Mark McGuire yeah. in the same game, which was pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I saw Piazza play. Um, actually, the high school I graduated from, he, he went yeah. there. Yeah, which is crazy. But yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, Yale, again, not going away, trailing Auburn by six, mm. 68-62, about five minutes and change left uh, in this one. So uh, not going away. And then Florida, uh, it's starting to get away from them. Colorado up 86-77. 
uh, with about six minutes left in that game uh, for Colorado. So those are the two games going on right now. I had to squeeze in a little baseball, get uh, back into the Titans and much more. Chase and TD in for Stillman and company today, 102.5, 106.3 the game. Chasing TD in today for Stillman and Company, 102.5, 106.3, the game. Uh, Auburn leads Yale 70-66, to 3.29 to go in that contest. Colorado has, continues to extend their lead, uh, continues to extend their lead 94-81 over the Florida Gators. Uh, so kind of resetting some of the Titan stuff that we got into you have a prospect that you again i call them td's darlings mm -hmm. out of missouri that you feel like 
would be a good fit, a potential candidate at 38. We talked about this earlier in the show, but reset who you think that is and why he'd be a good fit. Yeah, so look, man, losing Danico Autry to the Texans, that hurt that, for that the Titans. Stings. It, it hurt. They wanted to keep him, but they just weren't able to. What better way to replace him than with a younger version of him? And I think when you look at the versatility, and this is Darius Robinson, the Missouri. He had his pro day today, by the way. Um, he is not scheduled for a top 30 visit as of now with the Titans or anything like that. But you look at the, the versatility as far as, you know, there were times where Danico Autry lined up inside, outside. He even stood up and, you know, Autry is, is a bit – uh, no, their size is actually the same. They're both 6'5", 285, yeah. right? But heavy-handed, you know, guys, high-effort guys, guys that, for lack of better terms, you, you, they're goons. And you just, you just tell them, like, look, man, this is your job on this play. Go mess stuff up, <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and that's what they do. And it, it's fun to watch players that, that have that energy and just have that mindset of just being – like I'm just going to wreck stuff. It is my favorite thing in the world to watch a, you know, usually a defensive player in, in the NFL just have that look on that face on the face where you just go, I'm about to break you. Mm -hmm. I'm about to knock your head off. <laughs> yeah. Like like it's yeah. like looking at a dude across the line of like, you know, and then all of a sudden you look down, you know, and there's like a yellow puddle under under the guy because like you just <laughs> see the fear. Yeah, yeah. You know, but. That's what they need. I mean, they, they need, need because you got Jeff Simmons that already has that, and mm -hmm. I, and I think I I meant to ask you this earlier because I heard PK in in the morning show talking about this the other day. They do like once you get your culture figured out and you get your locker room, I do think there is a place for some you know as Pete Weber likes to say shift disturbers. Yeah, maybe insert another word there, but. You know, a guy that's going to come in there and 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 talk a little bit and 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 have that. Now, Jeff is big. Jeff is that guy. Like, yeah, he's one of them. You know, every now and then you you need to be like, hey, Jeff, back up, man. You mm -hmm. know, but I'm okay with a guy that he might get popped for a 15 yarder every now and then if it's like a fight in hockey. Like, it's setting the tone of like you're yeah. not coming in here and messing with me. You're not going. Yeah, and I, you know, the thing that's interesting is it doesn't always have to be. A premier player. No. You know who was a great example of that? Darren Bates, man. Darren Bates, a great example. You need X amount of Darren Bateses on your team. Like You need those guys, the uh, I-D-G-A-F, right? Yeah. You yeah. know the acronym, yeah. what that stands for? You need those guys, right? But at the same time, you need – a guy that can kind of corral that guy too, you know? So, And that's honestly, that's where Danico Autry was for Simmons. Right. So I'm just curious how that's going to work. But, uh, yeah, and I think that's what, you know, we talked earlier about kind of the, the, the missed opportunities. I think a Chauncey Gardner-Johnson would have been like, like he's that, yeah. that goon, like that, that, that level of player that you got to have like that. But you gotta My, have, yeah. you gotta have the the locker room that's strong enough that when you gotta when you gotta pull, pull back, him back, yeah, you can pull them back. Exactly. And like, honestly, that was Kevin Byard. Kevin Byard yeah. was perfect for that. Of if it's Jeff or it's somebody else that you know they, they're too much in the moment. That's like you grab you grab by the pads and go, hey, mm -hmm. hey, come on, come on, down, get back in the huddle, down, back in the huddle. <laughs> yeah, right. You do have to have that. But there is a place in the game for guys like that. Vrabel mm -hmm. loved guys like that. Yeah. Like, you know, like the, what he used to say that are violent and, you know, like just that kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can see it on both sides. Of the, like Kevin Mawai spent his whole career being that kind of player. Yeah. Like I remember the players did a poll one time of like dirtiest players in the league and he was like top three. He, he, yeah. Well, I, Simmons would be up there. Yeah. Because, you know? I mean, like especially offensive linemen, they're in there grabbing and, you know, mm -hmm. like all that – don't know what they're grabbing and all that yeah. stuff, but like, I'm okay with with some guys like that. I mean, I don't know. Besides Jeff, who would they have right now? I don't know if they really have that guy. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think they like do Cortland have Finnegan that had some of that in him. Oh, some a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, like, very much so. Ask D Mace, <laughs> Cortland and D Mace. You know, would he chirp with the best of them. But, mm. like, I'll never forget Derek and Cortland getting into it and then Cortland and Andre Johnson getting into it. And it was just like, you need that every now and then. Yeah, 
it's it's a tone setter, like you said. Because you can walk walk the walk and talk the talk. Yep. Uh, Yale will not go away. Now a two point game, seventy sixty eight, two thirty eight to go. Yale at the line, looking to try and tie this up. And uh, this is going to get interesting. And what a a texter just said on our text line, man, if the SEC goes one and five through the first six games, that's no bueno. Well, Flo- not looking good for Florida. Not looking good for Florida. They're, They're down, down ten. Yep, ninety four, eighty four, three forty five left. I mean, when you can't when you can't hit easy layups, you don't deserve to win a game. Yeah, uh, tied at seventy. Yale and Auburn, two thirty eight to go in this game. Yikes! I mean, can you imagine if Kentucky, Florida, Auburn, Mississippi State, South Carolina, and South Carolina all go down? You got Texas A and M that's about to play Tennessee, Mississippi State. Did you say them? Yeah, yeah. They they yeah, lost, they lost yesterday. Michigan State. So, yeah. Well, you don't bet against Izzo in the first round, <coughs> unless you're Joe Rexrod. Unless you're Joe Rexrod, mm-hmm. which is dumb. But, yeah, definitely a good one between Yale and Auburn. It's Chase and TD on this Fireball Hot Take Friday. Come back. And, again, if you're tuning in looking for Vanderbilt baseball, they have moved that game to tomorrow. It'll be a doubleheader beginning at noon, pregame at 1145, with Andrew Allegretta and company. So a doubleheader tomorrow uh, as uh, they decided to beat the weather. It is raining and uh, move that. So TD and I will come back. We'll put a bow on things on this Friday. 102.5, 106.3 the game.
Stillman and Company, 1025, 1063, the game. Chase McCabe, Teron Davenport in today for Jared Stillman, along with Ian Safar. Yale leads Auburn 73 72, 55 seconds to go. Oof. Florida is showing some fight down by six now. Colorado up 96 90, 140 to go in Colorado that game. Colorado has possession. Yeah, Colorado does have possession, but. Uh, oh, gotta get that rebound. I know. The, like some, just I watch some of these games, and it's just like fundamental basketball. Hit your free throws. Hit your layups. Rebound. You know, box out. Like all these things. So, uh, some some close ones in the NCAA tournament: Texas A and M and Nebraska. Uh, also about to uh, tip off here in just a little bit. But uh, just putting a bow on that. We've had a lot of different things today. <laughs> Predators on a sixteen game point streak look to make it 17 they've already broken the franchise record but i tell you what coming in here tomorrow with detroit as a team that's fighting for their spot in the playoffs you know the crowd is going to be into it. it's going to be a playoff type atmosphere i'd love to see the predators just knock them around the ice yeah i would love to see it too man and like i said the energy in that building is it's so it's it's addictive man it's addictive so. it's it's fun yeah and and like like I said earlier in the show that, you know, somebody asked me, what do you think, how do you think the Preds are going to be this year? I have no idea, but I think they're going to be fun to watch. They have been fun to watch, and, and obviously they've been good too. Yeah. And so you're kind of getting the best of both worlds uh, in that, and I just hope that it can continue to, to go that way, and I, I feel like it will. I mean, it's you see how many times have you seen teams have that season-defining moment and nine two was a humbling moment, like humbling I was at that game. Ooh. Yeah, right. I mean, but it's like I look at that as these are pro athletes, you know, that have done this for a lot. You know, some of them have done this for a long time, and they got beat nine two at home. And it's like that's humbling. You wake up, you got blood on your face, you know, on your lip. But I mean, you've been humbled, <laughs> and then it just. It clicks. You get, Did, didn't they win? They won the next game, right? Yeah, that's yeah, that was that's the start. When it, that's because when it started, yeah. Barry Trotz and Andrew Burnett had said, look, we were going to Vegas early to go to a YouTube ah, concert. Yes. We're not doing that anymore. I don't like how we're playing. And it turned it around. That's right. And so I fully expect when the Predators win the Stanley Cup, you two to play a concert on Broadway. They you know, better. For, for everybody. They better. Um, that would certainly be fun. But, I, look, it's going to be a fantastic – atmosphere tomorrow i i really hope that um you know that they can go in there and just continue their winning ways yeah without a doubt man without a doubt it's always good to see teams in the city win so and i remember all the talk and excitement about the predators stanley cup uh, uh yeah yeah now i wasn't th there it was the year before i got here but so you got I here in 18 right? 18 yeah, yeah i was 17 i remember you know everybody talking about you know how man this is a hockey city man yeah. the predator city and, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and I mean, it 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 became that. And yep. you had Taylor Lewan and the offensive lineman, you know, chugging the beers and throwing everything, the throwing the catfish. I mean, that was, you know, you had Mariota was there um, as well. That Now, they are going to have um, Jeff Fisher and the Cats there Tuesday night, which will be cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited about the Cats. They're obviously going to have their, their games too, but I think it's going to be cool. Absolutely. I want to be a part of that stuff, too. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, yeah. You're all about Use me. <laughs> yeah. You're all about it. But, you know, Coach Fisher was in here um, the other day with yeah. Chuck McDowell talking about it. But, I mean, they're, you know, they're going big on this with the return of the AFL and Municipal Auditorium. And it's dope, man. It's it's, it's going to be cool. Yeah. You know, I worked out for it. I, I was very close to, to playing arena ball. Yeah, I worked out for the New York Dragons. I mean, you can work out for them now. We're Jersey trying to get D-Mace Generals. to go do it. Nah, 47 years old, like, no. Well, D-Mace, D-Mace is sitting here going, at 50 years old, like, I'll go try out for the Cats. <laughs> Sam <laughs> Phelan. I don't know if you saw him. Yeah, he I did see that. Out. That was cool. Yeah, it was cool. <laughs> it was cool. Look, it was cool that he did. Yeah, I got to work with him on his running technique, man. It was Were bad. you like, oh. It, yeah, he was kind of running like a drunk, a, a, a duck. I mean, dang. Like a duck. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, I think it's going to be another cool thing for the city to have, you know, yet another pro team. You got, you know, the NFL, you got the NHL, you got MLS, and now mm -hmm. you got AFL. 
yeah. in town. The sounds, you know, with what they do in the in in you know triple A. Yeah, that's just a, a good, fun thing good to place see too. Yeah, good place to be. Uh, three point lead for Yale, seventy five seventy two. Auburn with the ball, forty seconds left in this one. Three point lead for Colorado. Oh, too. F- Florida coming back. Yeah, man, coming down to the wire. Oh, they got a steal. And Auburn just <laughs> Auburn just drove to the basket. They called a foul. And they called a foul. So he's going to get the N one. I think uh, no basket. No basket. Yep. Two shots down by three. Ah, did he, get, he got fouled. Oh man, man two this games. Is that are really coming both down. games like down to the wire. Yeah, both are coming down to the last thirty seconds within <laughs> a possession here. Had to stay in the studio and watch. Yeah, it. look, I'm, I'm enjoying like doing the show with TD, but now like I want to watch this. Yeah. <laughs> and. And, and and I may have used the ESPN Bet app at some point <laughs> on one of these games. Download today. What yeah, a play. <laughs> what a play. That is for sure. I mean, think about this. You got two SEC teams, both games coming down to the wire. That that basket should count. Oh no, it uh, he put caught back. it and dunked it and it was a putback. Oh okay. he was fouled before then. Okay. All right. Florida at the line. Uh now it's a two point game, ninety nine ninety seven. 22 point six left. It's going to be a one. Oh, he missed the free throw. Mm, the free throw. Make your free throws. Golly. Uh, I, lo- I do love, like, you know, when the defense can make a play and you don't have to foul. But, yeah. Uh, Got to make your free throws. Colorado with a chance to go up four now. 14 yep. seconds left. Yep. It was 97 yep. to 98. He missed a free throw. They didn't get the rebound. Auburn, 33.6 left. Makes the front end of the free throws. Now a two point game. I feel like I'm at a tennis match. I, I know. Like, it's like you know, right. about, yeah, you guys TLA. have TVs both on opposite TLA. sides. You're going back and forth, back yeah. and forth. All right, one point game for Yale and Auburn, seventy five, seventy four. Oh, he missed a free throw. Oh no, that mercy. Oh, uh, see, okay, my co- <laughs> I can hear it right now, Coach Tackett. If you're listening, it just free throws. There was one day he made the whole team like all they did at practice. Was line up and shoot free throws, and really? practice wasn't over until everybody made their free throws. It went three hours. Hey, I mean, it happened. Messed that's, around and got a triple double. That's right. That's going to do it for us here on this Friday. Have a happy and safe weekend. Predators back at it tomorrow. Vanderbilt women's right now they trail Baylor thirty five twenty nine on ninety four nine. The fan. We'll talk. Uh, Jared will talk to you Monday. I'll talk to you at nine on Chasing Big Joe one zero two five one zero six three. The game.